we uh, do Pelco repairs and they are dedicated Pelco video surveillance repair centers. One is in Delhi by the name of Export Trade and one is in uh, Gujarat, Surat by the name of Hitrack Electromech. So uh, talking about the team in India, so uh, I, you know, Pradeep Nair is the head of the complete geography. He takes care of the complete Middle East, India, and Africa. He is based out of Dubai. Then I, Sarandi Braveja, take care of the country business in India. And then I have my team, Aman Modgil, who takes care of the North and East region. Arpit Kabya, who takes care of the uh, Western region. Swaminathan, who takes care of the sales for Southern region. And then we have Kushbusha, who is the inside sales manager. She takes care of all the opportunities which are less than $50,000, which are more like quote and go and follow up. And then Mohammed Tabrez is a TSC, he's a guy for design, sales, estimation, BOTs, and POCs. And then we have after sales team, which is uh, Kiran and Sachin. Kiran takes care of, uh, SK Kiran takes care of South India, and Sachin Manu takes care of North India. And that team is uh, taken headed by Mr. Vikram Kolar, who has the complete APEC as a region. So this is the uh, complete team in India. And then uh, we have uh, on this call, a few guests from the Dubai team as well. We have uh, Vidya, who is the business development manager uh, for South Curve. She's also there. She'll be taking us through the video management part. Then we have Victor Mitri, uh, who's a business development manager for North Curve. He will uh, take us through the cameras part. And we have Shafuddin, who is the complete TSC for Middle East the region. He's also there on the call. He would be taking all your question and answers on the chat window. Uh, and now coming to the uh, major Pelco uh, project references. So this slide, we have summed up some key projects here on this slide because we can't show everything. We have around 26 to 27 slides covering the Pan India projects, what we have done. But you know, this, this slide basically captures all the major ones. And this also gives you a glimpse that we are present in all major vertical in the market, all major infrastructure vertical in the market. So whether we talk about uh, hospitality, we talk about industries, we talk about infrastructure projects, we talk about oil and gas, we talk about airports, you know, we present almost everywhere. So PGCL uh, is one of the uh, key accounts for us. We, and since last six years, we've given supply to more than 1,400 plus PTZ cameras across India, so all their uh, 192 substations, which comes under the uh, prestigious NT AMC project is on Pelco Solutions. And then we have Accenture, uh, which is again a pan-India customer, 70 plus locations, where we're supplying them 8,000 plus cameras. Then Reliance Jamnagar, again, uh, one of our important oil and gas customers. They've been one of our loyal customers since last uh, 13, 14 years. They've been using 550 plus explosion proof cameras. And then we have recently done Supreme Court new building, which has almost 900 plus cameras with a video, video expert video management platform. Then we've also done the Pakistan Atari border, which is again has 200 plus cameras with a video expert PMS. Then we have done a prestigious cricket stadium from Matera Stadium in Gujarat, which again has 200 plus cameras with the video expert PMS. And this was in limelight because of the Trump visit, uh, Trump visit recently, you know, all must be aware. We've also done the prestigious Statue of Unity project, which again has 200 plus cameras and a video management platform. Then we have done, uh, you know, some big hotel projects like Pullman in Novotel in Aero City, Kempinski, Hayat in Raz Aero City. Again, all of them are 500 plus camera projects with our VMS. Then we have also done the uh, BJP headquarters, again, a very prestigious project, which is a presently elected government. We've done their headquarters with our complete cameras and video management system. And we have also done the Tata Steel uh, Jamshedpur plant, which is a huge campus uh, where the steel manufacturing happens. We have covered the complete perimeter, entry, entry gates, all the junctions with 600 plus cameras. And then we have done multiple AIMS hospitals. So this is our you know, glimpse of the healthcare vertical as well. So we've done around seven to eight different AIMS hospitals, just to name a few, Patinda, Gorakhpur, uh, Delhi. Delhi also, there are multiple OPD blocks, burning plastic blocks. And uh, now we are also, you know, getting into a couple of more AIM projects. So we've given them almost 2,500 plus cameras across different sites and India with a video management uh, platform. And then we've also done 12 airports with the Airport Authority, Authority of India. Uh, these are smaller, small airports spread across India. 
and we have also done this prestigious project for national war memorial which is a war memorial you know as by the name of it you can get very defense personnel this is a war memorial in the memory of the people who have lost their lives in a country uh, they they're also we given to us the cameras with a video expert platform yeah and uh, on the next slide, uh, I will talk more about you know our strengths as an end-to-end solution provider. So in this slide, you see you know uh, as I said, Belco is one of the few OEMs uh, in the market who is an end-to-end -end solution provider. What I mean by that, I mean that you know we are not just only into the cameras or the VMS or the analytics. We are into the complete solution which goes into video surveillance space, whether it is cameras, whether it is video management, whether it is associated accessories which go with them, the pro services, the, where, where our engineers go on site and help you in uh, commissioning and other stuff, and even the certifications as well. And we all are also into a lot of analytics like NPR and facial recognition and stuff. So this is, this is, this, uh, the, uh, I'm emphasizing on this is because there are very few OEMs in this globally who can do the complete end to end solution. And we are one of them. So that that's the basically the glimpse about Pelco Global and Pelco India, and you know, on our solutions, or whatever, you know, we are into in solution provider. Now we'll take you to the next step, which is you know, when we'll talk detail about our camera technologies and cameras. For this, I request uh, my colleague Victor to take it over and take it further from here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, Victor. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Victor Mitri, and I'm the business development manager at Qatar and East Med. Uh, today, we're going to go through some of the exciting uh, topics. One of the topics that I really like, which is the cameras, the cameras technologies. We're going to emphasize a lot on the technologies for very important reasons we're going to discuss later on. And we're also going to go through some of the latest product updates that we have released in Q1, Q2, 2020. And the main purpose here when we talk about camera technologies is to be able to differentiate a lot. Like when we talk uh, about cameras, I often see customers really getting confused when they look at two cameras with similar form factors and similar resolution and they see two different price tags and they get so much confused which product. If you have one request, can you just enlarge your screen? Uh, it is, but I, uh, hold a second, let me do this. Just give it a second for, is it better now? Yes, much better. Yes, yes. Oh. yes, yes. Okay, excellent. So to understand why technologies is to, it's a very important thing. Before I go this, I just want to explain to you like this example here. When uh, you're looking at two cameras with similar form factors and similar resolution, what could be the difference that price of a camera can be double the price of the other camera? Similarly, uh, the, the, the best way to explain this, that cameras actually, it looks like a PC. It's, it's, it's a complete PC. If you're looking to, if you're going right now to shop for a computer, you will look that two camera, two PCs that identically the monitors can be at full resolution or full HD resolution and the same housing, the same keyboards and whatever. However, two PCs can look double the price of the others. And the reason here is what goes inside this technology. Camera is a computer that it uses processors and it uses, as you can see here, what's the camera consist of? It's a camera, it consists of a lens, a housing, and what's inside the camera that what makes the camera expensive. When we are talking here, it's what type of a lens it goes into, and there is a lot of things to talk about whenever it comes to the lens. Then the CMOS sensor, and then it goes into the CPU. And some of the cameras can have multiple CPU, central processing unit. And then you will have a DSP, which is called digital signal processing, video encoders, and DA converters, all the way till the Ethernet components that goes along and the housings that goes along with that. So 
as you as a PC, as I said, as a PC, you can tell the difference between i3 processor and i5 processor and i9 or i uh, or i7 processor, and uh, the RAM difference between 4 gig and 8 gig integrated video card or dedicated video card, and what's the RAM on the video card and the capability. Why of all of that? We're gonna discuss this through the session. So what I want to say when you look at uh, two cameras today, you really need to go to understand what goes as a processing power behind that, what CMOS processor it's used, which technology, which generation that goes along with that. Because of that, this is what the camera can deliver to you and can process a lot of things for you. And we're gonna talk about some of these technologies today to help you understanding what the camera process and what's the requirement of high processing power in the camera. So the first topic here we're gonna talk about the cameras, which is the light sensors, is the what's the challenges that the light sensor or the normal camera can face. Camera, normally we know that the camera see lights and what's the, could be the channel. We understand that the day, it consists like uh, the camera see either a day or at night. So at day, it's there is lights and night is with a low light situation. However, this could be way more compl uh, complicated than that. In situation, this could be a uh, dim interior, shaded exterior, uh, glaring light, mixed lights, bright light and low light, dramatic lighting variation in a scene, fast light changes, fog, and this is what sometimes can really complicate situation. And even sometimes it can be more complicated than that. Like, and it's, it can be very simple. Like if the camera's position towards the floor where the floor is a very reflected surfaces and there is a light uh, reflected directly to the camera. So if the surface is a reflective surface while the interior of the room is completely shaded or dark, this can also create a lot of uh, challenges for the light because some of the time as you can see here and the example on the right side where the customer think or initially he thought that any camera could work great in a stadium as long as it's due the resolution the pixel density we came to the customer and told them it's going to be far more complicated than that and the reason as you can see here that when a stadium it's normally it's fully lit and you have more than 500 lux all over the place but the stadiums for example it is a multi-purpose hall that when you start the session, you will, and most of the time when you start any event, you will end up having something like uh, an event uh, or like a party or a celebration where the first thing that they're gonna do is switch off the entire light in that scene, start a fog completely in that area to start a light laser show which will create a lot of blooming into that area that will be shedding directly into the camera. And you will see a lot of variation between the extreme white and dark areas. So when the customer thought it's completely very simple situation, it's turned to be a very complex light situation that you will require a camera that provide you 60 frames per second, 60 frames, each frame should support low light, bright light, fog and wide dynamic range. So to process all that at 60 frames per second, that require a lot of processing power in the camera itself. In order to do this in our company, in our technology in Pelco, we have a technology called Sure Vision, which compromise of hardware and software. The technology here, the processing power, it's capable to deliver 130 dB wide dynamic range, extended to all the way uh, to low light, uh, all the way till 0 0.03 lux. And when we use low light technology, we need also to use 3D noise filtering, enhanced tone mapping to deliver a great image quality at extreme low light and anti-bloom technology. We're gonna go through this little by little and explain it more in details. So this is a technology is available on some of the product lines that we have. To explain the wide dynamic range and when we need it, 
this is uh, just a small example to explain the wide dynamic range. When do we need wide dynamic range? When you have a variation in light in the scene, not always. When situation like this, as you can see, outdoor situation, light is around 2000 lux, where indoor it could be like 100, 200 lux. So as you can see, there is a huge different uh, variation in light. And the camera, either it will be overexposing some of the part of the image and underexposing some of the part of the image, which will let into not being able to read all the details indoor or outdoor. In order to activate or to work with that, we use uh, Sure Vision technology, 130 dB wide dynamic range, where you can see uh, clearly here what's happening outdoor for forensic evidence and what's happening indoor. And if the surface is was reflected, even if you don't have that much of light outside, you still need a wide dynamic range. So take this into consideration. You have to worry a lot about the flooring, the floor sometimes in situation where it can transmit light to the camera. This is an example here to and to explain what the wide dynamic range. So there are different, uh, uh, the wide dynamic range is not as easy or standard as what we can expect. So there is a lot of things to talk about the wide dynamic range, just only to simplify it that we uh, follow a true wide dynamic range. I keep receiving a lot of pop-ups guys here to admit people. I don't know if you can fix this. Um, so uh, there are different uh, variation of the wide dynamic range. So between the DWDR, which is the digital wide dynamic range and the true wide dynamic range. So the differences here, just to explain the true wide dynamic range, true wide dynamic range, it's variation of two pictures that it's been taken on a two intervals of times, one of them at a long exposure and one of them at a short exposure. And the reason here to try to sort out the issue of one of the overexposure and the other one is underexposure. And then we merge those two images together and we provide you the best out of them. So what does it mean for 30 images? video output. This is 60 images in the background is being taken and providing you with 30. So the camera is actually processing 30 images and then processing another 30, uh, sorry, 60 images initially and then processing another 30 images. And that's what's going to be your output. So your output is 90 images per second. All of them is going to be processed at the same time. So you can imagine how much uh, the complexity of this when it happens in the camera itself. And of course, there's a lot of things to also to discuss about it, but just that's the true wide dynamic range that we provide in our cameras. The low light, it's also a very important thing that's concerning a lot of the customers because low light comes with many issues. One of them, it decreases the bandwidth. The second thing, it destroyed the image quality and it will provide you with something called noise. The noise, it's the one of the things that it decreases a lot of the bandwidth and at the same time, it destroyed the details as you can see here at the bottom of the image. So in order to, tree, to deal with the low light, we need to deal with the three applications at the same time. One of them for the low light, the second uh, to, uh, to deal with the RGB spectrum, the second one for the 3D noise filtering in order to filter the, uh, the, the images and remove the extra excessive details that we don't need it which is called the noise and the third application called the enhanced tone mapping because as soon as you filter the image the image will be washed out from details and you will not be able to de uh, read many of the things like you will not be able to tell the difference between an eye and a nose then what you will require is another set of application, which is enhanced tone mapping to enhance the details in the image and will provide you a sharp detail as you can see in the example Anti-bloom is another important technology, especially when you work in an environment that it's not controlled environment. So for example, if you're talking about the street applications where you cannot control the environment of the lights, you will have a very uh, low light situation in most of the cases on the streets. And then suddenly the camera, as you know, the sensor will be open to be very sensitive to light. And suddenly you will find a car vehicle passing towards the camera and it will create something called the bloom effect or the camera will be completely blinded with the extra flood of light. 
So to deal to handle this, we need to deal with the technology called anti-bloom. The anti-bloom technology, as you can see on the example on the right side on top, the camera, it's at a very low light situation, 130 meters away from the camera. We were able to capture the license plate of that vehicle, the model number of that vehicle, without creating any sort of a halo around the image itself or the vehicle itself. So to show you more detail how this situation can happen in complex lighting situations. So for example, if the camera is trying to capture the people and the license plate, and there is another different lights at the background, what will happen that you will have a halo, as you can see in example, in camera V, camera P and A. This, when you try to check the forensic evidence or the license plate, you will miss a lot of details. This is the first example was for the facial identification. Look at the license plate. You will find that the license plate is completely washed out. You won't be able to read these details. So anti-blooming is a very important technology, especially when you are you cannot control the environment and the lighting in the scene. Image defog also is a very important thing because in many of the times we cannot control the, the weather conditions. So how the camera react to the weather conditions is a very important thing. So in a fogging situation, most of the camera lose focus because the camera try to focus at uh, the, the, the fog itself and you will find that most of the details is washed out or the camera is completely out of focus. So the way that we handle it in uh, our technology and cameras, we have 3D fog modes, medium, uh, low, medium and high that can dehaze the image, provide you with a very crisp image at all lighting conditions. This is the result of one of the installation that we have installed recently and we've done a demo in uh, the customer. The customer actually didn't know Pelco. They are happy with a, a third party company, another very, very well reputed company. And they were saying that their product is doing good. So when we told them, let us uh, to, to give us a chance to do POC over there, they allowed us, but they didn't know the benefits of having our technology sure vision versus the other competition. As you can see in the image over here, the video under the uh, the bridge itself, that's a very shaded area. And there is very harsh light on the other side. While you can still see clearly the lights and the shaded area and the other area, which is under direct light, there is no any sort of overexposure uh, exposure or underexposure. You can easily be able to freeze the image and read every single part of the details of the image itself without any sort of challenges. So to show you the difference between when we put our camera versus the competition, the customer initially were very happy with their image on the right side. So with the company that they were dealing with, they didn't find any issues. I'm not saying that it's a bad, uh, that that product is bad or good, but look, you can tell here the difference between our technology versus the competition and you can judge for yourself. And this is the result for the technologies that we've discussed earlier that starts from the sure vision and when the uh, the uh, the haze mode. This is another example that I like to normally explain to the customer because actually it explained the complexity of the lighting situation. However, I need to apologize about the image quality here. The reason that this is Im this image is poorly done because I've taken this picture from my phone over the monitor of the customer. They they refuse to give me any output, so I've taken this. And what the reason that I like to keep going talking about this example because the customer initially called us and many other competitors to do a shootout for them and the, the result that he was very happy with the image on the left side that's another very reputed company uh, and they were saying that we are happy and they didn't select Pelco initially saying that uh, they didn't like the, the, the coloring in uh, Pelco however they were very happy with the color as you can see on the left side the exposure the colors it's uh, the, the contrast in the colors and the blue and the yellow he was it blowed his mind when I went over there to find out what exactly the reason that they were saying that other companies better to see what is the problem here. Is it uh, a white balance issue or is it a challenge, uh, challenge of different things of the setting of the camera? I was like uh, shocked that our image 
for security was way better than I was like initially directly told the customer that whatever you're seeing is not for security purposes. And the reason here, try to look at the image on the left side and try to see the challenges that goes along with it, starting from the right all the way till the left. So if you look at the top right of the challenge, there is a person inside the booth over there, that guy with, an, uh, with a light on his head. And if you try to look at the details, you won't be able to see any of the details. And if actually, if he's at a very faded color tone of skin, uh, extremely white, and there is a white on top of him, you will not be able to see anything except the ghost effect. On the left side, you can see trees and a parking lot and doors. And if you try to think of a security or a, from a security perspective, if a, there is a dark skin toned person next to any of these areas behind the trees or the inside the parking, will you be able to see that person? You will not be able to detect that person because it's completely overexposed image and it's completely burned. So for forensic evidence, this system or the operator will not be able to see the details. Now go to the other side on the Pelco on the right side image, the second one to the right, and start looking at the uh, the extreme right. Now the, the, the person who's inside the booth, you can see clearly the colors. And if you notice that there is a light uh, bulb next to the uh, on the door gate over there, which is a very, very bright light and the blooming is not affecting the person inside the booth and you're being able to see the details and read it clearly without any issue. You will be able to see the people on, and on the left side. If you go on the left side, you will be able to see the trees and the color tone of the tree all the way that inside the car parking and you will be able to see the shadows and the and the lights and the uh, the the uh, uh, the windows on the left side. So everything is from a security perspective. The camera is totally different, uh, or the the output is totally different than what you see on the left side. Any question? Okay, we move to the other part uh, the, of the uh, technology. So here we cover the wide dynamic range and low light. So basically what's the Sure Vision? It's a technology that it's include hardware and software together that we provide wide dynamic range along with low light, along with anti-bloom and anti-fog at the same time without affecting the image frames per second and other features of the camera. So all of this will be happening at the same time without reducing or affecting uh, any of, uh, of the other features. While competition will be able to do and handle this, however, they will provide you one or two things at the time and that will also take away other things like, for example, if I will provide you on the other, with, when, when you have a limited resources, you will be able to provide wide dynamic range, but you will lose, for example, the low light. When you provide the low light and wide dynamic range, you might lose the frames per second or the resolution or do you might uh, lose other features of the camera. And this is some of the hidden information that you will not be able to read it with the data sheets, but you need to experience it. And that's the differentiator here. We use a processor, dedicated processor, that will be able to process all of these challenges without affecting the image quality and provide you with the best image quality at all lighting conditions. Video analytics is a very important topic as well today. Today, uh, earlier we used to talk about uh, the uh, rule-based type of analytics and today we have the deep learning analytics available on the edge, which is something that we were not able to discuss back in days because we needed to have a lot of processing power. Thanks God today that, uh, to the newer technology and the updates on the technology on the processing. Now we can drill some of the technologies, uh, the deep learning technology that it used to be on a server and we put it on the cameras. So to explain this, the differences between the rule-based analytics and the deep learning analytics, I can just explain it in, in, a, in a very simplified way. The rule-based analytics does not understand the scene the same way as a human we understand the scene. So it, what it understands, it's a frame, video frame one, two, three, four. And then what is the differentiation or what happened difference or the, the pixel changes between the first uh, image and the second one and the third onwards. So this is where the camera can or the analytics will understand that there is something happening. 
However, it will not be able to specify what is that thing happening in the side. So it will not be able to tell it's a human, it's a vehicle, it's a cat, it's a dog. It will not be able to specify this. It is not that easy to configure because you need to train the camera a lot in the scene to tell the camera what is the object that size that you're looking for. You need to adjust it. It's not pre-trained, so you need to train the camera. So for example, if you have 5,000 cameras in a site, it will take a lot of time to configure these cameras. I'm not saying it's impossible. It is possible and it's very much possible. And we've done it and it's very effective. However, it takes longer time because you need to train the camera and you need to understand the scene itself. From processing power, it doesn't require a lot of processing. So this is the rule-based analytics. That's why it's available on most of the cameras today. And uh, it, it, it is light comparing to the DNN. Learning, it does not learn, as we said earlier. So what's the difference that the deep learning analytics can provide over the rule-based analytics? The deep learn analytics is completely the opposite. It understands things the way that the human understand it. It's already learned. So we, when we provide this technology, it's already, we configure the camera that uh, we already train the engine of the camera to determine what is a human, how the human look like, how the vehicle look like. Uh, we fed it with thousands and thousands of examples of let's say a cat for, to distinguish a cat from a human, from a dog, and what could be the differences between them. So the accuracy level on these ones and the false alarms on using the deep learning is way better. It provides less false alarm even at a challenging lighting situation. And this is where the accuracy on the rule base can really drop down in the challenging lighting situation. It can specify, as I said, human from animal, from object, and, and, and. And it's much easier to configure because we already teach the camera to understand what we are looking for. And the camera directly, when you choose the proper analytics that suits your challenges, it's easier to deploy. Processing here on the other part, which is that's the challenge here, that the DNN will require a lot of processing power. And with a lot of processing power, that's mean we need to use a proper processing CPUs and these CPUs higher end. So, of course, that will increase the price of the camera. To give you an example between those two on what is available on our cameras, so we have the Pro Series and the Enhanced Series. So on the Professional Series, uh, the we have a three analytics, basic analytics, anything from a simple motion detection to camera sabotage and abandoned object is available on the uh, Professional Series. On the Enhanced Series, you have the nine analytics available for you. Uh, that you can see here uh, from adaptive motion, directional motion, loitering detection, object counting, object removal, and stopped vehicle, all available in this rule-based analytics suit available with Telco free without paying it, included with the price of the camera itself. You just need to configure this and you can, you can have up to two analytics at the same time running. Now, the deep learning analytics is also available on our enhanced tree and started in Q1 2020 with the Video Expert 3.8. So the deep learning analytics will, as we said, like we started it, so there will we will start updating this and it has much more features, uh, like a, a detailed feature than the, uh, the, the rule base. So today we will be able to detect human, as you can see, identify human and the zones itself. And we can do use it for application, for example, advanced people counting in retail applications or advanced people counter flow in, for example, uh, airports or let's say buses areas or a metro where you're trying to see people going in or out at the same time. So this can have this technology can help them a lot and can uh, stop uh, or reduce the alarms a lot and improve the, uh, the, the the quality of the analytics directly available from the camera itself without the need of server-based analytics, which we know very well how expensive it could be and the integration part that can be complicated. 
camera link is another very special thing that is available in uh, Pelco. Uh, to think about the camera link, think about it in two ways. How do we operate the cameras that we have? Today, we have a lot of number of cameras between PTZ cameras, which is Pentel Zoom, movable cameras, and we have fixed type of cameras. So how do we control these cameras? Normally, we use an operator. For the PTZ, it gets a little bit complicated. Think about it like as an operator or as a driver, for example, take a situation of a vehicles. I have nine vehicles and a single driver. How many vehicles I can drive at the same time? I can drive one. What about the eight? They will be staying there and no one will be able to touch them. And the same thing with the PTZ cameras. You will find situation and sites that there is tens of or maybe even more than that of PTZ cameras and a single operator, then who's operating these cameras? And most of the time, there's no one operating these cameras. So, and, and the reason that this is important because if when you put a high-end camera, it's very important that to justify why you're putting this camera and how this camera works. So today you will find most of the PTZ cameras is an auto tour or it's fixed on a location that the camera is not even looking at anything. So how do we do a deal differently? We have something called camera link. Camera link where we link two cameras together, the 180 or uh, 270, 360, 4 Optera cameras. So we have multi-sensor cameras that when, depends on the site, you can choose which camera that you need. So if the, the view is require 180 degree, you can choose this, but it can get more complex for 270 degrees where you are seeing a complete corner of a building and that can, you can watch it completely and monitor all the situation in that area. But the, what it makes it better that you will be able to connect another PTZ camera to it to either control as an operator the camera manually or to drive it automatically to operate itself. So we'll show you the two examples here. So for the first example, I'm going to show you how an operator normally will operate a situation using the camera link uh, and how easy it is for them to move the camera. As we know that most of the time, the, the operator will operate the PTZ camera using a joystick. And the joystick, sometimes in certain situations, you will have a latencies and you will suffer because of the latency. So you're trying to zoom in a little bit to the right and you will find the camera is going much to the right or to the left. And this, this situation, most of the time you will find that. And, and sometimes it's not that much accurate. You need to dial in the camera. You need to know the camera number. And sometimes it's just like you're trying to zoom and the camera does not respond properly. And when you zoom to the right, you lose whatever as a situation, what's happening on the other side. So you're trying to zoom on a certain situation and you'll miss all the action on the other side. When you connect those cameras together, the camera link here, the multi-sensor is seeing the entire field of view, showing you the entire field of view, but at the same time, it also allow you to click at any part of that image and the PTZ camera directly will go and start providing you with a digital zooming for that area. So it's much easier for an operator to use this to control the camera over using a joystick or a mouse to control the camera for pan, tilt and zoom applications. The second scenario, what if there is no operator controlling the camera right now? What if the camera is there? Am I going to leave it on auto tour? And if it's on auto tour, what it's looking at? If we link those two cameras together, the multi-sensor and the PTZ camera, we will be able to, and we, if we configure the analytics properly, we will be able to track object into the scene automatically, as you can see here. Instead of leaving the camera 24 seven going in a tour, looking at nothing here, the camera can track an object one or multiple object automatically without losing anything, any sort of event at your site. So for example, if a person right now passing into my area directly, the multi-sensor will be able to detect that person and tell the PTZ camera, go and track that object. If another person comes in into the site, now the camera, the multi-sensor, again, it see it although the PTZ was looking on the other side and it tell the PTZ go and start tracking this person and provide the image of both uh, like this person or the, the nearer person or the faster or the closer to the camera person, or it depends on your configuration as you can see in the example here. So here I don't have to leave the PTZ on a 
auto tour mode that the camera keeps spinning 24 seven and reduce the time life span of the camera just because I'm keeping spinning the camera without any single order. Also, whenever you manage the PTZ cameras, the one of the most important part is the autofocus capabilities of the camera. And here we can show you on the six series of the cameras how fast the autofocus in the scene. We told and we trained the camera that don't ignore the other area of the street. However, if someone entered the premises, instantly start autofocusing. And as you can see, the moment that he stepped in the person, the camera took full control and start the control of that person. And it can zoom in. And more and more and actually today we have the generation number seven the seven generation of the spectra which is way faster and more accurate than what you can see over here so that's even much better than what we are seeing today H265, it's a very important topic to all of us. And the reason that it's important because it affects our pockets directly and it affects the image quality. So when it comes, one of the things that we were talking er earlier and I heard the person is like, we were trying to be as good as possible, effective as possible in the quality and at the same times in the price, we have to be very competitive. To be competitive today in the pricing, we need to look at it from every perspective. How can we reduce cost? Today, if you come to me and tell me Victor, how can I reduce cost without affecting the quality of the image? One of the very strong weapons I can use today is the H265. Let's, do, let's understand a little bit what's H265 over the H264. Uh, H265 is the new compression called HEVC, High Efficiency Video Codec. It's the new standard of video compression. It provides much more improvement of the H.264. On the earlier standards of the resolution, where today we are following more in the 4K uh, resolution. However, the earlier it was the full HD. So last year onwards also it was a full HD. And today we can talk about 4K as a standard of the resolution. And on the, stand, on the full HD, it saves bandwidth around 57%. And on the 4K, it can provide you with a saving up to 64% on the UHD, which is the 4K. So that's significantly a lot of saving. So consider today the same number of cameras. If you are paying, for example, uh, $10,000 to store a camera today uh, to, to buy a storage for number of cameras, now you will be able to spend half of this, which is 5,000. For a huge project, instead of using petabyte of storage, now you can use 500 gigabyte, a terabyte of storage, which is tremendously a lot of saving for the customer. And this is what the customer is looking for. They are looking for the reducing, and this is one of the things that it helps you to reduce. Now, let us understand how the HEVC works or H.265 works over the H.264 and how it saves the bandwidth. The H.264, it divides the screen into 16 by 16 grids without understanding what's happening in the background. It's always 16 by 16 and it depends of whatever is happening and it's always gonna move the details from the uh, frame one to frame two onwards. HEVC is totally different. It's more dynamic. It understands the frame, it understands the scene, and based on the movement in the scene and the complexity of the scene, it can decide whether it goes with one sort of box, as you can see here to the right side, or multiple. So let's take a look at the details. Look at the fingertips of the, the instructor. While in H.264, you barely can see two zones of interest on that area. In the HEVC, you will find nine plus two. That's more details that in HEVC versus the H.264. While if you look at the top left corner of the wall itself, there is one on the H.265, one box only of details, while in the H.264, it's providing nine boxes. So what does it mean? What does it tell us? The H.264, although it was a very good technology at that time to save bandwidth, by providing 16 by 16 grids. HEVC today is more dynamic, it's more effective, it provides more details when it's necessary, and it reduces these level of details when it's not necessary. So for example, it's a white wall. Why would I put nine grids into that areas and provide I and P frames into it? There's nothing happening. It's a single shaded white wall without any single movement. So I can reduce a lot of bandwidth by implementing this. 
Also, H.265, it's a very effective for smart predictions, while in the H.264, you had nine uh, sensors for predictions. In H.265, you have 32 squares for predictions, which provide a lot of uh, like speed and improvement from H.265 for prediction over the H.264. As we know that the, the frame consists for many people will understand the INP frames. However, there's a lot of prediction frames that goes between the INP frames. So every uh, group of images consists of I and P frames, but in between them, there's a lot of predictive frames. So while it was available nine in the H.264, now it's 32 in the H.265, which provide a lot of predictions much smarter than the H.264. So it's not only saving bandwidth when you're applying the H.265 over the H.264, it is more sharper in details when you need the details, and it's faster in prediction over the H.264. So today, if you ask me, why would I use the H.264 over the H.265? Really, I really have to work it hard and uh, really think hard to justify using technologies, all technology in H.264. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not against the H.264, but I'm thinking that it's phasing out and uh, the future is going to be for H.265. And on our series, new product series, all the new product cameras that we have, H.265, it's available today. Smart compression is another way. Initially, we talked about the H.264 and H.265, which is a standard video codec and compression method. Uh, however, each company having their or strive to provide the best image quality and save bandwidth and compress the image as well. And uh, we have a technology, we have done one of the very, very unique technologies that separate us from the compet competition, and we call it Pelco Smart Compression. So first, what is compression? Compression is whenever you're trying to take a huge type of bandwidth and details and reduce this type of details in order to fit a specific bandwidth. So let's say that if the bandwidth is 100 and uh, or the details is 100, however, my bandwidth does not allow me to take all of these hundreds or carry all of these 100 details with me. So I'm going to be happy carrying, uh, let's say, 30% of these details. But what happened here when I carry only the 30% of these details, I'm losing the other 70. And this is not a reversible process. So what happened whenever I compress the image, I'm losing a lot of details. And when I lose a lot of details, I will not be able to reverse it back and after I compress the image and be able to rebuild it back. So I'm losing a lot of details and that's very painful in businesses because most of the time you end up compressing the image thinking that this is the situation's good enough, fair enough. However, when you look for forensic evidence, you will need that details and you try to build it saying what's wrong, what went wrong. This is, let's say, 4K camera or two megapixel camera and supposed to give me enough uh, pixel density for identification. While what happened here, you compress the image a lot and you have missed a lot of details and you weaken the image quality. So it's very important to save bandwidth, but at the same time to maintain the quality. And this is where smart compression shines because it's a dynamic engine that works in the background all the time separate what's important in the image from what's the things that's not important, apply a lot of compression on the non-important parts. So the walls, ceilings, floors is not an important thing. I can generate and take the details of these frames from previous frames and rebuild it back again. So that's not an important thing. However, what's important for me is a human. What's important is action and movement in that image. And this do not in this case, do not apply any sort of compression. So when you look at Pelco video compression, the uh, the images, the compressed one versus the non-compressed one, you will not be able to tell any sort of difference in the quality or you cannot see any degradation in the quality in the, those two examples. However, if you look at the uh, bandwidth, it's almost at half. Look at the details over here. Nothing is the, the the image quality is at half. Uh, the sorry, the bandwidth at half. However, the image quality is identical, and that's the video compression that we provide at Pelco with the smart compression. Smart compression is a very unique technology, especially when you start using it with dynamic GOP, which I'm not going to explain a lot today because of the time uh, to keep following the time. 
image stabilization is a very important topic as well because most of the people hear about the image stabilization however they don't really understand it so i just gonna take few seconds here to explain the image stabilization two type of image stabilization that's available in our cameras and when to use them and when not to use them so image stabilization it's a solution and this is something i always see customers falling into it so they always get the the maximum out of it so i apply image stabilization on all type of cameras this is shouldn't be the case let us understand when do we apply the image stabilization first image stabilization it's a solution for a problem so if you don't have a problem you don't apply the solution when we do we use it whenever the camera shakes so when the camera shakes and i want to provide you with a stable image without a huge shaking in the image i will use the image stabilization so when is this application can be applicable if you install the camera on a pole that the pole keeps shaking because of the outdoor environment or the camera is outdoor even if it's sometimes fixed on a wall but there is a lot of wind moving the camera or sometimes the ptz cameras needs to deeply focus on optical zoom at a very like a 30x and uh, any small change on the 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 camera shake it will create a lot of change on the camera on the output of the camera this is when i will need to use the image stabilization so what are the two types of the image stabilization here you can use and what we hear a lot about is the eis which is electronic image stabilization and you also have optical image stabilization where those two technologies is different uh, in the way that it works but however it provides you both at a very stable image quality uh, or image without having a shake. So to understand them, EIS, it's electronic and optical, it's mechanical and electronic at the same time. <coughs> which one is good, which one is better? Let us understand how does it work. So the electronic image stabilization will take 10% out of your image and will crop 10% out of your image and use it, utilize it to compensate for the movement. So basically what you will be able to see is 90% of your image quality. So this is why I'm always saying like here, EIS or image stabilization is a great technology. However, it's not always the case where you need to apply it so it reduces 10 percent of the image quality however it solves a bigger deal for you whenever you need to uh, uh, to solve the image as you can see on the bottom right side over there so when it's the uh, image is stable as you can see on the how does it work uh, the images is always centered in the center and if the camera goes to up to the left or to the right, the camera have enough margin of 10% to compensate for that movement, as you can see in the frame at the bottom left side. So with this compensation happening, even if the camera shakes a lot, you will still be able to see the center type of the image and it will eliminate the movement of the image. It's a very fast, very effective. So for high frame rate and for very fast movement object, this is the go-to product too. The EIS is the best here because it can produce without rendering or without any sort of delays the, uh, the, the number of the images. So it does not apply any any sort of latency to the image. Optical image stabilization from the name, it's optical. So it's suspended lens, as you can see of the example, it's suspended lens over the camera module using springs and electromagnets. And these sensors detect, once it detects the frequency, the amplitude and the shaking, it start, uh, uses equivalent electromagnets uh, to match it and adjust the angle of the camera. When you do this and when you apply this, it will take a little bit more time than the EIS because of course it's a mechanical process. However, it's used, utilized the 100% of the image quality. So it's more effective in a, in a situation that you need more quality, but lesser frames per second and lesser speed. So EIS is way faster, way faster, and optical is, it provides 100% of the image quality. When to apply with this technology or that technology depends on the application itself. Do we need image stabilization in all cases? This is the question where you need to start understanding when do we apply and when do we need image stabilization? Questions? Okay, for in this example, I'm gonna show you the example of 
the real life situation of image stabilization, the need for it whenever you apply, you put a camera on, you mount the camera on a pole and the pole is a little bit shaking. So you can notice here the shake, the little shake, this can disturb the image quality. And uh, if you try to freeze the image, you will not be able to read a little bit the details on the face or the license plate. So when you apply the image stabilization right now, as you can see here, the details is completely the, the clear and there is no movement shakes and it's fixed that issue. OnVIF is another important thing because we often see the OnVIF and we see different profile on the OnVIF, but we don't understand the differences and the importance of these of uh, of the OnVIF. So we always, I always see customers saying, yeah, the camera is OnVIF and expect a lot of things when it's on VIF S and uh, because of the lack of understanding the details of each one of those uh, profiles, uh, it creates some confusion. So here to explain this, in the cameras we have four at least on VIF profiles that you need to consider. On VIF profile S, G, Q, T. Each one of those on VIF works differently than the other and complement each other. So you cannot use them. If you don't consider, if you have the G, the, it will provide you what is available on the S. No, you need to have S, G, Q, T to have the full features. So while the S it provide you video streaming and configuration, G can provide you even more configure request and control recording. It can also provide receive audio and metadata. A Q can have easy setup, discovery, configuration, and control conformant for devices. And T will support H.265. It will provide image settings, motion alarm, and tempering event like the analytics, metadata streaming, and bi-directional audio. So this is very important. Like, for example, T is needed whenever you have H.265. It's needed whenever you have analytics or you need analytics integration. So if you don't have the T and you don't have the same product video management and the cameras from the same brand, or let's say the, you don't have the directed driver for it, they're from that brand, you won't be able, you will lose a lot of things here by considering that on with it's, it's gonna be there. So you better be very careful whenever you are trying to put solution in combining video management with cameras and if they don't have the directed driver. Very IR, it's also a very important topic, and I found it a very interesting topic, especially in our cameras and in certain ma models of our Pentel zoom cameras. What's a very IR? It's similar to adaptive IR, uh, like uh, for the infrared, we know something called adaptive IR. So how the adaptive IR works, it adapts to a scene, a specific scene, it takes its time. It tries to understand what's the scene exposure level from overexposure and underexposure, and then apply a certain level of lighting into that scene. So often it can be good, but certain cases it can be over or underexposed, or a certain part of the image can be over or underexposed. So it does not really, uh, it cannot be effective 100% here as the uh, adaptive IR, and it takes a lot of time to adapt to the scene itself. While in PTZ, this is a very challenging situation because if I'm gonna move the camera from left to right and the camera would, will require a lot of time to adapt to the scene, I will lose a lot of details. So how do we deal with that? We have a technology called Very IR in Pelco where we have variable lighting level, as you can see, infrared level in the image itself. And once I'm moving the camera based on the optic itself from 1x to 5 all the way to 30x, the camera will change the lighting level uh, or the, the, the range of the light. So as you can see here, some of them for 10 long range, 10 degrees, the other range for 30 degrees and the other one for 60 degrees. So what happened when I'm moving from 1x all the way to 30x, I'm not asking the camera to adapt to the scene. I'm adapting mechanically and optically directly to the camera, and this will not affect the timing and the image quality at all. So you can see in this example how accurate and fast I'm being able to read all the scene of the details from 1x all the way till 30x.
now the camera went from 1x to 30x and as you can see the moment it clicked the the camera did not need time to to adjust the image quality or the lighting and the image quality and instantly move to it clear any questions so far Saren, can you hear me? I don't know if the voice is disconnected. Yes, yes, Victor, we can hear ah, you. Okay, awesome, thank you. So 4K resolution is another important thing. Today, it's a new standard and lots of people are talking. There's a lot of hype about 4K and very soon there will be 8K and keep going. So what's the resolution? Why it was two HD, full HD, the differences between the full HD and the 4K? And what's the important, how will it help us? So first let us talk about the full HD, 1920 by 180, which is two million pixels. It was a very good standard and we worked a lot with it. However, it has less Less pixel density than uh, and it some for certain applications it might not be uh, a, a good solution and because of the small pixel density we couldn't increase the field of view while the 4k it's four times that resolution and way wider in the field of view so here now I can as you can see here the full HD was failed to read the license plate while the 4k provide me with a way wider field of view and if I try to read the license plate at any given part of the image, I have enough pixel density to be able to provide me with a classification, identification, or recognition it depends on the application itself. So when to apply full 4K, and uh, for many people, they were saying like the 4K it was, uh, it can consume a lot of bandwidth or data, or it can cost me a lot. Today, you can reconsider this with the H.265 and the, H, uh, the smart compression. You can save a lot of bandwidth. So the 4K today, it can decrease the number of the cameras because it have a wider field of view. So for open areas, instead of putting two to three cameras of the uh, full HD, I can, in certain, certain in a situation, I can put one 4K camera. And uh, also, it because of the bandwidth, I can use the smart compression and H.265, and it can reduce the, the bandwidth for me. Cybersecurity is an, another important topic. We will discuss it further in the second uh, the uh, slide, but it's very important topic because the reason that it's very important that it's already a fact that thousands of the and millions of the cameras and DVRs, uh, it's uh, open or it's easy hackable, uh, uh, it's it, it vulnerable for hacking. What does it mean? organization that pay thousands and tens of thousands of dollars to secure their company or organization, they are vulnerable that their security system can be uh, a threat into their network. So for example, if you use uh, a camera or any part of uh, a product into your network that has a vulnerability, it can affect the total security or the vulnerability of your network. And at the same time, it can be used against you for people to tap in and monitor what's happening into your organization. So in order to stop, you, uh, stop this, we are following the FIPS uh, standards of 1402 and we are approved by Department of Defense in the United States. Uh, Victor, just now because you have started a very important topic of uh, cybersecurity, you know, so this is a very important topic. So what I'll do is we'll uh, talk a little more on that. Aman, if you can just uh, take us to the slides for that, I think let's cover it in one go only. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, I'm trying to go as fast because I have a very little short time, so I'm going as fast as possible. Do you want me to go de details or later on you will discuss that? Uh, so what we'll do is, I'm going to have some slides ready, so we'll just go through it and then you can continue with the well balance. So, so you want to go through? already started. Yeah, okay, we'll just go okay. Through some slides, yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah, you can share, uh, see my screen, right? Yes, I mean, we can just uh, yeah, put it on the presentation now. Yeah. So it's visible, right? A normal single screen? Yes. 
Yeah, so as uh, Victor was uh, sharing, so we, we as a Pelco just want to cover about the cyber security. So how, how we take care of the cyber security in our uh, Pelco system. So just give you a brief idea about that. So for us, Pelco uh, cyber security is not a one time uh, approach. It's a complete uh, process. So as, as you can see, I mean, I mean, today the response to cyber security threats is constantly evolving. You may have been protected against threats yesterday, but uh, new risk emerge daily, malware, ransomware, and these kind of points, I mean, we all, all, almost heard everywhere. So while it's easy to claim you are 100% protected against cyber attacks, the reality is that danger lurks every time. You can connect new devices, equipment, and application to network or the cloud. It's only by taking proactive steps to mitigate risk and policies dedicated to quick response, you can minimize threats to one of your most valuable assets, that is your data. So how Pelco is achieving it? So first uh, step to that is NDAA. So NDAA is basically a National Defense Authorization Act. So NDAA is basically passed by the US government. Uh, uh, according to the US government, there are certain OEMs which, which having some security flaws in the past. So they're having some problems of uh, hacking or some, some other problems. So as per that, NDAA, the US government has completely banned those OEMs. There are three to four OEMs, their name, they mentioned as per the NDAA. So they, those OEMs have been banned. Even uh, there are some OEMs who are getting manufactured or getting refurbished their product and selling in the market, mostly we see in India region. So as per the NDAA, those, those, are, uh, those OEMs are also banned. So if we talk about a Pelco position, so all Pelco products listed on the US government government contract as per the NDA are complying. So you talk about any Pelco camera, you talk about fixed camera, PTZ camera, even our BMS, all are NDA compliant. So that is a very strong uh, uh, step towards the cyber security as a Pelco uh, took it. So after NDA, if we, uh, we're going to cover as uh, Victor already covered there, we are taking care from multiple levels. So so next step is the RMF and NST documents. So it's again uh, US defense uh, services or federal services. Basically, it's a kind of system hardening guide. So if we have to uh, do a business with the US federal services or defense services, these are literally a 250 plus paging document that that uh, product has to comply the 250 plus uh, com NST compliance document only after that product is compliant and even uh, then we can sell this uh, product to the US federal services. So our Pelco VMS is completely as per the RMF as a NIST documentation. We have seen very, very few OEMs uh, all across the globe is complying to this uh, NIST documentation. And the next already, uh, Victor mentioned there's a FIPS 142, basically it's a cryptographical module which has been used. So again, uh, our VMS is completely FIPS 42 compliant. So again, it's a uh, law with the US that if we have to do a business with the US federal services or defense services, this should be a mandatory. So our VMS is also uh, completely uh, complying with the FIPS 142 cybersecurity cryptographical module. So these were one of the uh, points where we were complying, but apart from that, how Pelco approaches to the cybersecurity. So if you talk about the Pelco approach, uh, if you talk about the normal in video surveillance, there are multiple approaches. The first level is authentication. So authentication is a whenever some uh, person is or some system is going to point to the server or the system. So it should be authenticated. So how we are achieving? We are achieving through HTTPS protocol. There's a multi-level password uh, protection is uh, uh, can be achieved through the att uh, att uh, sorry, authentication level. So, and after that is the authorization. Authorization is the 8021X is a port-based authentication. So why this kind of authentication and authorization is at least that whoever have a right access to the system or the network, only those authorized people can have uh, access to the network. So these are the approach to authentication and authorization. Then the next part is encryption. Everybody uh, today is talking about the encryption. So how we are uh, doing encryption. So we are doing encryption at the multiple levels. So encryption during video in transit during video at rest at the storage level, uh, encryption at the database level, and encryption at the multimedia level. So how we are achieving is through RTP, AES level of 128 or 256 of encryption, TLS level of uh, encryption, basically TLS end-to-end, -end, your communication from camera to system server is uh, going to be through TLS, which is end-to-end uh, -end, uh, secured encrypted uh, platform we are giving. So we support multiple security feature to achieve one secure plot, uh, platform. So all these security features comes into play in a different part of product development life cycle and marketing initiative Pelco does. So that's one of our strengths. All we are able to do because of our experience in industry, because of the capabilities of our people, we're able to design products and we're able to deploy products. And we ensure that our products and services meet the needs of end users with regards 
what they need to do have protect their technologies and also making sure that we are able to meet all the local regulations so that's something unique to pelco and that is a strong value proposition of our brand so these are some of the uh, point we were taking care of here as a cybersecurity so victor uh, you can uh, thanks, take thanks, over thanks 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 so just to sum it up so you know if you need more information on which all brands are banned in nda and plus which all brands they are doing white labeling for if you want those details we have all the information is available please feel free to contact supertron and we'll help you you know with all those information thanks everyone and victor back to you Can you see my monitor? Y yes, Victor, we can just need to put it in the presentation mode. Okay, you see it now or no? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so the we finished the first part, which is the update, uh, the, the camera technologies. We went through some of the technologies that we have, some of the unique technologies that can have and the updates on our these technologies. Now I'm just gonna go through some of the updates on our camera product line. And uh, to explain the product line very fast within Telco, we have fixed and PTZ product line, as you can see. So the fixed, anything from the dome, different form factors, uh, all the way to box, bullet, multi-sensor, fish type, uh, 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 fish eye type of cameras, and all the way to Excite, which is the explosion proof type of cameras. Similarly, we have on the PTZ different type of cameras and uh, pentel zoom from the uh, uh, the dome type of pentel zoom as you can see with uh, IR or without IR and you can have also the industrial type of spree which is the bullet that can go all the way up to the horizon and the excite enhance for the pentel zoom cameras for explosion proof applications. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the updates here about the two the professional series and enhanced series on the fixed the type of series of the cameras. So the professional series three, the updates that we have today that we have a very exciting product and it supports multiple form factors as you can see here from mini doom, wedge cameras, bullet cameras and box type of cameras. And the some of the features that it, uh, it's available on these cameras, it supports true wide dynamic range of 120 dB. Resolution goes from one two, three, and five megapixel cameras. It comes with three configurable streams over two in the past. It supports low light and adaptive IR. On the analytics part, it supports the motion detection, camera sabotage, and object removal counting. And the frame level or the camera processing is capable to provide you up to 60 frames per second on the five megapixel series whenever you drill down the resolution to four megapixel. So these cameras are very much capable and also it support 30 frames per second at all resolutions. So you can have from one to five megapixel at 30 frames per second and it supports H.265 as we discussed earlier, the new compression method and motorized autofocus lens and smart compression. So that benefiting from the H.265 and smart compression, you can save a lot of bandwidth. It's NDAA compliant on with SGQNT. It supports up to two terabyte of micro SD. Uh, on the housing, it's IK10 vandal resistant and IP66, IP67 for outdoor application. For environmental model, the temperature it can withstand from minus 40 all the way till plus 60 degrees and indoor models minus 10 all the way till plus 55. And it comes with three years warranty. Now, how do we order this material and the differentiation between them? So you have between the indoor and outdoor models, one to five megapixel, as you can see here, and you can decide which model number that suits your application. And you have list of optional accessories available with these cameras. The infrared, as you can see, can goes all the way till 50 meters adaptive IR. The bullet 
type of these cameras. It supports also infrared indoor and outdoor and uh, 2.8 lens. You have different variation of lens configuration, 7 to 22, 9 to 22 and 5 to 50. And depends on the lens configuration, you will have again, different type of resolution. So it's, it's important to understand this chart to know which models and which resolution fits at uh, whatever requirements that you have. And also a list of optional accessories that you can order it from pole mount to environment surface mounts available and in ceiling mount. The box cameras flex, uh, also available with a different configurator, configuration from one to five megapixel. It supports also PIRS lensing on better depth of field and wide choicing. And also list of uh, accessories available from housing all the way to the box uh, accessories and the mounting accessories. These are the lensing options available for the box option cameras. And as you can see, the lens can go from 2.2 all the way to 50 mm or 80 mm. So you have a different configuration, which is something very exciting. So it's basically can suit most of the applications for the customer. So I don't, I don't know if any application will require more than that, uh, but 2.2 uh, to 80 almost, or uh, it can, uh, it, it can summon most of the application that the customers today they have for a fixed type of cameras. This is the wedge type of camera. Again, it comes in a different configuration and resolution from one to five and different lens options. Now that was the professional series and uh, going into the enhanced series, which is the high end product line that the one that we've discussed earlier. So the enhanced series comes with unmatched image quality. It's for light challenging situation. So when do we use it? It's a very important thing. So whenever it's a mission critical application where the customer cannot take uh, ends and ifs for uh, problems, uh, it's, it's very important to choose this product. Whenever you are having a doubt whether the normal cameras, the normal standard cameras will be able to sort the solution. The enhanced series is the go-to product. So if you have applications in casinos, roads, city centers, license plate, facial identifications in airports, seaports, these are critical mission application. It's very important to understand that the light can change over there, the situation, the environment can change a lot, and you should be ready for what the camera should provide you a best image quality at any given level lighting or challenging in the camera can face automatically without the need to go and redo the configuration. These cameras comes with a very, very strong housing. And today we support IP66, IP67, IP68, and IP69 uh, uh, on these cameras. And on the dome camera, we support IK10++, all the way to 60 to 65 degrees, up to four hours, and IK10 on the rest of the, on the bullet camera. The cameras comes with three form factors, mini doom, bullet and box cameras. Again, some of the features here, uh, it's the resolution support all of two, three, five, and 4K, eight megapixel cameras. Uh, the sure vision is available on these range of the cameras. So it's 130 dB wide dynamic range, ultra low light, uh, anti-bloom, anti-fog, 3D noise filtering at the same time. It comes with three configurable streams. Uh, on the analytics, as we discussed, it supports deep learning analytics and the uh, analytic suits that's available with the uh, Pelco cameras. Uh, P iris lenses for a better depth of field and better precisions and sharper details. Uh, image stabilization uh, available and redundant power supply for the failover, sorry, power uh, supply failover. This is a very important feature for customer and critical missions. For example, and to give you an example, how does it work and when it, do you need to apply it? Take a, uh, most of these cameras are powered using PoE switches. So when the PoE switch is online giving power, everything goes great and there's no issue. So you can power the camera. But what happens if your PoE switch, the main source of the power and data fail? 
in this event, you not only losing your network, you're losing also the power for the camera. So even if you have an SD card on the camera itself, you're still losing the, uh, the, the, the recording and you lost the camera, the feed and the recording for later on. So the way that to go to here, you can provide a redundant power for failover in case the uh, switch for any reason or another failed, the camera will continue operating and writing automatically without the need to uh, flip it uh, or to switch it to manually. And the camera can directly start recording on the SD and you can retrieve this information automatically later on as soon as your network is on back again. From the image processing, these cameras are very capable. They can go in frames per second all the way to 120 frames per second at full HD resolution. This is a very, very uh, massive change and improvement on our cameras where we used to max max at 60 frames per second earlier. Today, we can reach up to 120 frames per second. The application for this is a very critical application. For example, highway uh, license plate, or you're trying to um, cover casinos or uh, actions in a situation where the things that is happening very fast in a very short period of time or a span of time of coverage, and you're trying to cover this very fast action, 120 frames will provide you with a very detailed image at all, uh, at all situation and all speeds. Uh, it comes with motorized autofocus lens and again H.264 and H.265 available with a smart Compelco smart compression option and you can have up to 30 frames per second at all resolutions. Uh, it's MDAA compliant on VIF S, G and T, 2 terabyte storage SD card up to. Uh, IK10 plus vandal resistant here which is 50 joule. IP66, IP67, IP68, and IP69, and uh, NEMA 4X, it's available for outdoor application. Uh, IP54 on the indoor models. For the environmental models, we support temperature from minus 40 to plus 60, and also we support 65 degrees for up to four hours of operational. It has shock and vibration resistant and comes with three years warranty. To go into the configuration and how to order the product, as we discussed, it comes with two to five, eight megapixels. It comes with a different range and the dome camera with uh, configuration of the lens from 2.8 to 8, 8 to 20, 4 to 9, and 9 to 20 and uh, indoor and outdoor models and full range of accessories and the cameras as we said uh, the dome camera supports ik10 plus plus 50 joule impact rated it comes with 40 meters uh, plus adaptive ir on all dooms and uh, as we discussed earlier ip66 67 68 69 type 4x on these cameras nema 4 on the bullet uh, type of cameras, again, it's we support two to eight, and you can see different range of configuration of lenses and mounts and accessories. The box camera, two to eight again, and the recommended lenses here, the lens we can go to, to uh, the, the, these lenses is ICS lenses, the camera support the ICS type of lenses, which is NPIRS lenses. So uh, you can have more details and faster and more accurate details and profiles using the ICS, which is one of the high end uh, lenses in the latest edition for the lenses series, something similar to professional type of cameras and can help a lot in reducing the vignetting and improving the sharpness and the content of your image uh, over the, uh, the so you, especially when you are changing the optics and the cameras from different zoom level, these cameras can do, uh, these lenses can do much better than the standard type of lenses. Now, one of the product line that I did not cover, which is the value line, but I've just focused on the professional enhanced series. However, we're gonna release the value line, which is also very important, and exciting topic. Perhaps that will be, if we have more time, we can discuss it later on. But in order to understand today, when to choose which product, and this is a very important question, many customers they face normally when selecting a product because sometimes it's the price is important sometimes the application or the challenge in that situation so i made this chart here just to simplify things here to differentiate between what's the value line what do you expect on the professional series the enhanced series 
So if you're looking for a resolution up to 8K, the enhance, if you're looking for a sure vision technology to deal with all lighting situation at the same time, uh, that's again, the sure, the enhanced series. If you're looking for DNN up to nine analytics on the rule base or the DNN type of analytics, you need to consider the enhance. If compliance is requiring IK10 plus or IP68, IP69 for applications, specific applications, this is on, so again, it's available on the enhance. You can go for IP67 for the professional series or IP66 um, on the pro series and value line that goes all the way till IP66. A wide dynamic range, 100 dB on the value line where it can go extended all the way till 130 dB with low light on the enhanced series, while it's on 120 dB on the professional series frames per second if you're looking for high frames per second or standard 30 frames now you know the difference 30 60 and 120. if eis electronic image stabilization is a very important for a specific application whenever the camera is on a pole so if you're mounting a camera on a pole it's a very important to consider the enhanced series over the professional and the value series Temperature, if you're worried about the temperature in specific areas to go high operational temperature on the enhanced series is operating up to four hours to 65 degrees, while in standard places or uh, locations can go to 55. So if your standards is 55 degrees, the pro series can do the job, value line can go to 50 degrees. H265 is available on all our camera. Power failover is available on the enhanced series. IRS control, it's P IRS on the enhance, auto IRS on the pro, and fixed IRS on the value line. ICS is available option only on the enhanced box cameras. Onviv is, uh, as you can see here, SGQT, and uh, I noticed that the enhance is missing one of them, the Q. Uh, form factors, you have more form factors on the value professional over the enhance. So, uh, one of the other things that can be also one of the consideration depends on your region, the, the COO country of origin. The value line, it's COO is China. Professional is, uh, uh, I forgot that I keep saying Singapore. It's, um, correct me guys, the professional series, the COO. Taiwan? Uh, Taiwan, Taiwan, yes. Taiwan, yes, sorry. Taiwan and, and enhance, you can order it with two CEO levels. You can have it with Taiwan or COO USA. So you have both options on the enhance for compliance issues in specific countries. And uh, like for countries like in the region in the GCC, they prefer to have COO USA or European uh, uh, CEO country of origin. So this is available on the enhanced series as an option as well for the customers. Uh, Victor, I think uh, we have to rush a bit. Okay. How many minutes? <laughs> you already exceeded. <laughs> okay. Okay. So just very fast, I'll close with the Spectra 7 and then I'll uh, go back to you. So the Spectra 7, uh, it's one of the latest edition of the Spectra Enhanced series. Uh, it's a PTZ camera. The main changes here is the, the resolution that's available on this camera, the DNN capability, and the image stabilization available on this camera. Again, it comes with two flavor, two to 4K uh, options. The two megapixel goes all the way till 30X, the 4K to 18x deep learning engine available one of the also main characteristic changes here h265 and the direct to drive the speed of this dome is 700 pan and 500 on the tilt real-time clock for faster installation and again it's ip66 ip67 and 4 X NEMA and comes with three years warranty. One of also one of the things that it's interesting, it has integrated SFP port for faster and easier installation. Uh, the Esprit thermal again comes with the fixed type. It comes with dual head uh, optical and thermal. The optical supports 720p, which is one megapixel resolution, and the uh, the thermal support VGA a QVGA. And you have a PT option that can go 14, 35, 50, and 100 mm option on the PT lenses. With this, I will go back to you, Saren, because sorry for that, I exceeded my timing. No worries. Uh, thank you, Victor. Thank and you. before we go, yeah, yeah. 
And before we continue, uh, there's a polling, uh, you know, polling button you will see on bottom of your screens. There's a poll which is going on. We request you to please participate in that. Okay. We didn't do it, you know. I'll, I'll look at it right now and start answering the question. I didn't notice it. I was seeing something popping up, but I didn't know because the screen was on full screen. So no, I'll... no, 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 Victor. This is not only for you. This polling is for all the participants, basically. It's not for okay. us. Okay. It's for all the participants. So there's a question which we have put up. You know, which vertical will send money post COVID-19 on video surveillance market? And we've highlighted some verticals. So I would request all participants to please participate on that polling. It's right on the bottom of your screen. Thank you. And over to you, uh, Vidya, for the video, expert video management systems. Right, I'm just going to share my screen. Give me a minute. Are you able to see my screen, sir? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. I know we've um, we we don't get a chance to do a break like in meetings, um, but if anybody wants to grab coffee and have to you know, sit through another hour of me talking, uh, please feel free to do that um, while I do the introduction. Um, Vidya, I, yeah? Vidya can, can, can you hold for a second? Yes, I can. Uh, polling is going on currently. Okay. There was only one questionnaire huh? for the polling. Hello. Dave, we have only one question, right? For the polling? That at what places uh, post COVID it shall be utilized? That was the only question, no? Huh? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Sarin, just for my idea, um, how long do we have? Uh, we have the session till five because so we have an hour video. An hour, okay, perfect. Okay. Friends, we'll close the polling another one minute. So currently, 39 pa participants uh, attended the polling out of 73, that is 53%. VMS को अटेंड करना चाहता था बट अभी मैं देख रहा हूं कि ये भी अच्छा है बट अभी मैं ये चाहता था ये आप स्लाइड तो शेयर करोगे नहीं Another 30 seconds. So friends, we'll be now uh, closing the po end the polling. So only the 62 participants 
done the polling so we are stopping now So thanks participant uh, now you can see the polling result so out of 79 68 58 participant attend the polling and majority the first priority everybody is saying is public facility healthcare building and educational building then the second is public place. Third priority infrastructure and transport. And then city surveillance and so on and so forth. So there's another interesting result come into the picture here is, is religious building and government building. The thanks participant for your Paul? So I now request with there to take over. Thank you, participant. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, I can you okay, I'm I'm hoping everybody can hear me. Uh Saran Sharaf. Yes, okay. Yes, okay. okay. Yeah, fine with you. So we uh, we did a detailed look on the cameras, and now we're going to go into the video management piece. Like uh, uh, Victor and Saran mentioned, uh, as Falco, we do the entire end-to-end -end system. So I'm going to give you an insight into the video management platform. So what are the common challenges that are faced when um, when somebody looks at uh, a VMS in today's uh, in today's um, industry? One, you've got very complicated, unfriendly platform interfaces. Um, it's, it's very difficult to share video and data across multiple sites. Monitoring 24 by 7 with limited staff resourcing can be challenging. You've got different types of systems, so that means the training and you know uh, the training needs are higher, and you need uh, you have increased operational downtime. Uh, it, sometimes monitoring multiple security platforms and applications leads, leads to operational difficulties. Um, instant, in, incident investigation uh, from multiple platforms and again, multiple data sources can be extremely time consuming. And then there's lack of actionable data, which makes it difficult for you to have some, a sort of a real time response and, and rapid decision making. So these are some of the things that we've collected in terms of VMS challenge. And uh, the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is to tell you how video expert, which is our video management platform, meets um, and, and in certain cases exceeds a lot of these uh, uh, challenges that, that a VMS, uh, um, you know, control, a uh, control room that uses a VMS face. So one of the major aspects that Pelco's uh, video expert looks at is the user interface. You know, you, you can have an application that is very high end and very complicated. And if its user interface is friendly for an operator who spends a lot of his day-to-day -day time, um, you know, doing all other applications instead of just uh, worrying about the interface, it makes his, his time and energy a lot more efficient. So operator user interface has been a core um, importance in, in Video Expert. Uh, obviously, there's the other aspects of it, the, the application, the servers, the workstations, et cetera, which I'll get into detail about. There's a lot of emphasis that we place on our stability and cybersecurity. So the failover redundancy, the RAID, I'll talk about that uh, in detail. Uh, it, um, I think Aman uh, spoke a little bit about the, the cybersecurity aspect in terms of our compliance. Um, and then there's also another important aspect that we get a lot of end users coming up and asking is how open are you? You know, how, how, how open is your platform? Uh, can you integrate with third party applications? Uh, what more can I do with the security system? So that's the aspect in terms of the integrations that we discuss. While I start, I have to tell you that uh, doing a presentation on software is always a challenge because um, you know I'm, sent, I'm just showing you physical slides. I would encourage you to reach out to the Pelco uh, team 
to our uh, distributor for uh, setting up uh, either in this condition remote uh, uh, demos or um, you know once the, the situation has unlocked uh, to, to, to physically go and see demos. Um, that's a great way to get an experience of the platform. Uh, but I'm going to try and summarize um, sort of the high level features and the architecture uh, through these slides. Please continue to use the chat window for questions. I've got my colleague Sharaf on it who's answering. So, you know, please use that um, so we can, you know, address the questions as and when it comes up. Right, so this is how Video Expert is broken into. Yeah, we, uh, we look at it broadly in terms of the number of cameras. Um, um, so there's entry level, there's uh, mainstream, and then there's enterprise. So if you have a small entry level requirement, about 30 to 50 cameras, or up to 100 cameras, we, we would propose the Video Expert Professional. Um, when it is larger um, requirements, uh, you know, with more than 100, 150 cameras, then we would start looking at the enterprise. And when you have multiple sites and multiple cameras, then we would, uh, of multiple uh, cameras, we would look at aggregation or um, the, the congregating it or bringing it together to a common control room. I have to also tell you that uh, two, two important things to remember with Video Expert in terms of the application. The software remains the same for both the professional and the enterprise. Uh, there is no difference in, in the, the software as such. Um, it's mainly depend that the, 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 the differentiation lies in the hardware and, and, and the aspect of what type of hardware is used. Um, there are situations where the number of cameras might be lower, but because of the criticality of the site or the criticality of the project, we still propose the enterprise. Uh, so, for example, if you need failover redundancy, or you know, it is a in our case uh, locally here, we you know the prime minister's office, for example, uses an enterprise. They they probably don't have thousands of cameras, but we still use a uh, an enterprise system. So you can, uh, you, you know, there is flexibility in choosing whichever system that you you'd like to go in. Um, I'm going to go into these two categories because aggregation is a totally different conversation, but, uh, and, and then let's look at the details on this. Let's start with the easy one, which is the professional. It's a, you know, use, simple, uh, straightforward, single machine um, application, uh, single machine system. Um, it's scalable, so you can increase the, uh, the, bo the boxes as you require. It's all in one box. So it has the database, the recorder, the viewer, and the toolbox all in one uh, box. Obviously, that makes it more attractively priced, and you don't kind of compromise on, on the performance of features. Um, there are different hardware um, options that are available, depending on what permutation and combination you need. So you've got the Eco Series that will have RAID 5 and JBOD for about 64 channels at 200 Mbps, the Flex Series, which is for 100 channels and 450 Mbps, and then the Power Series that is for um, 100 channels and 450 Mbps, but it comes with RAID 6, RAID 5, or JBOD. So depending on the requirement, you can pick and choose uh, you know, what type of um, um, all in a one box that, the, that you require and, and it's pretty much plug and play. Extremely easy to install, um, you know, the user interface, like I said, video expert software focuses on the um, user interface. So, so it's uh, pretty straightforward. Let's go into the more uh, detailed uh, overview of the enterprise. So enterprise is obviously uh, designed for ease to use with minimal training experience, but it's a very robust system architecture. Uh, and it allows you uh, ease of integration across existing investments or, you know, across different partnerships. Um, you eliminate different single point of failure. And this has been a main highlight for Video Expert. Um, you know, we don't have a single, we eliminate a single point of failure in the way that we build that architecture. You've got, um, you can leverage alarm management, analytics, you know, you can connect any third party uh, in any on with compliant camera. You can um, uh, assign tags. You can. I'm, I, I will talk more in detail. But this is just kind of the high-level summary of the of the specification. Let's go into the architecture. What does it comprise? Um, you've got the network. You've got cameras that are connected to the network. The first uh, hardware device that you put that that you will notice is the CMG or the Core Media Gate. Uh, the C, the the Core Media Gateway is serves as a database server for for video expert. Um, that's where all the information about where the, which cameras are recording on what uh, uh, hardware, uh, you know, what are the specific details, etc., are stored. It is not where it is configured or maintained or enacted on. It is just a database server. Um, the 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 workstation is the interface between the control room monitors and the uh, system, um, which is also uh, connected to the network. 
And then you've got the storage server. So basically you do a, a, a calculation on what is the storage requirement. And then these, record, these uh, storage boxes are recording server devices. So they manage the streaming, they manage the bandwidth, they manage um, you know, the, 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 the entire capacity of the, of the number of cameras that are coming in. Um, depending on the storage requirement, you would have multiple of these boxes. And this pretty much some, um, you know, is the basic architecture. Now, if you fill over redundancy or say uh, in the specification, the, the, the end user says, uh, I don't want the database to go down. I want to be able to add cameras even when the network, uh, even when the system is down. Um, you would have uh, an additional core media gateway server, which will which is fail over redundant. Um, this is the different scenarios in how you would deploy the architecture. So if you have a standard 2500 camera that does not require fault tolerance, you would have a single CMG box, the, the database uh, box. If you ne need active active with, if, uh, uh, availability with failover, then, then you would use two, so two CMG boxes. Um, when the number of users go up to 10,000 uh, um, or anything above 2,500, our recommendation is to go with an additional uh, core media gateway just to be able to do uh, load balancing. Uh, and obviously, before, uh, once it increases beyond 10,000 cameras, then it becomes um, you know, a lot more uh, an independent load. Uh, you, you need a lot more number of CMG servers. Um, I have to also, you know, this time, because you, you would see a 10,000 camera and saying, you know, are there projects like that? There are projects like that. The largest security installation globally, I think for any manufacturer, um, is a project that we have done called Galaxy Casino Macau. It's an 18,000 camera project, fully live with mirror recording, failover redundancy. Uh, we kind of like to challenge ourselves. So this was one of the first and the largest projects of Video Expert. So if anybody comes in, you know, asks you, oh, what's the big project that you've done? You can tell them where we've put 18,000 cameras online and it works. And it's been a, a fully live functioning site, functioning site for the last three to four years. So, um, so there are requirements like that. So when you see, um, you know, the a, a volume of that size, do not uh, hesitate to go and you know evaluate how Video Expert fits into that requirement. Um, when it comes to storage, uh, we are partnered with Dell EMC on the storage aspect. Uh, what that means to you is it gives you the confidence of the uh, of the, the 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 capacity and the quality of the storage solution that we're providing. Uh, it is not a standard Dell uh, hardware that we're just connecting. It is a Pelco Dell uh, uh, partnership uh, uh, product. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, um, uh, you know, technology that we've put in, in terms of the firmware, in terms of the application, et cetera. Um, these are the options that are available. It comes in two series, the E series and the T series, which we'll talk about uh, now. This is the T series. Um, the, basically it's a 96 TB, 144 TB. It comes in a two U rack. Um, you can um, have RAID, uh, RAID 6 storage uh, enabled on these boxes. The, the warranty on this, and this is something I'd like to highlight, is we're probably the only manufacturer today in the market that gives you five-year warranty on storage. Uh, everybody else will give you two years, three years on servers, one year. Um, we're probably the only ones that give you five years on, the, on an enterprise storage. Uh, the performance of these boxes are, you know, as, as mentioned here, in, uh, in terms of recording, they're 700 to 1000 Mbps for these boxes. And the playback is at 175 Mbps. Uh, when you go to the E-series, um, it kind of ups the game a little bit. Uh, these are much bigger, density, higher density boxes. Uh, it's 168 TB, 216 TB, and it goes up to 288 TB. So that's a lot of cameras that you can put on a storage box that helps you drive cost. Um, it's all RAID 6. Uh, you, it's a uh, SAS drives. Uh, the E C D, the T, uh, sorry, the T series is SATA drives. So the, these are, um, you know, higher uh, quality drives. And NIC, uh, you've got the dual NIC on on these boxes. Uh, or again, comes with a five-year warranty. The the differentiator being the performance. As you can see, the recording um, uh, bandwidth goes up to two thousand five hundred Mbps. Um, and, and the reason why this is important is because the number of cameras that you can load on a box, um, if you're familiar with competition, does not depend on the number of cameras per se, it depends upon the bandwidth that you use. And that's why this performance rating is important. So it depends on how many cameras that you're streaming, at what megapixel resolution, at what bit rate. And that's what defines how many cameras go on a storage box, along with, of course, the storage requirements. So you have to look at that permutation and combination to understand how this, um, you know, to what are the options to choose. 
Um, so these are the available hardware in terms of storage that, um, that, that you can choose from. Um, just to give you an overview of how the failover redundancy works, this is, this is how the failover redundancy works. So say you've got multiple storage boxes, VX1, VX2, VXS1, VXS2, VXS3, and multiple, and you put a standby failover server, uh, failover hardware. You can choose, there is no necessity to choose the same equivalent storage value for, hard, uh, for, store, uh, for failover. You can choose a smaller volume if you think that you know, any issue can be resolved in seven days, for example, or 10 days. Depending on how many days you want the failover to last, you can take that into account. Uh, many times, you know, we would have multiple 96 or 144 TB boxes, but have only a 48 TB as failover. So there, there's no the rule that says you have to use a 96 TB failover with a 96 TB box. There's no such thing. So um, just um, as, so say as time goes by, recording happens on each of the uh, storage boxes. Somewhere down the line, say BXS1 goes offline or you know, you've got a hardware issue and then the failover box takes in. So you'll see data three now recording on the failover box. It continues to record in it, everything works fine. And then when BXS comes back online, um, it, uh, it continues to record back on VXS1. Um, it, the, the, as the recording continues, say another day VXS3 fails, um, the storage then starts recording back on the failover box. So it is a one is to n architecture. So any for, for multiple number of storage boxes, you can use a failover. You can use a single failover redundant box, and that helps you optimize your storage effectively. Once it comes back online, the, the storage goes, um, it starts re continuing to record on that particular uh, storage device that it's assigned. So that's pretty much how uh, the failover redundancy on Video Expert works. Um, to give, let's, let's look at it from, you know, how does competition do it and what's the unique um, differentiation for Pelco's Video Expert. So when you look at competition VMX, VMS, uh, you, will, you will need cameras, you will need the VMS software, OS licenses, database licenses, the replicator software licenses, uh, separate server, recording server hardware for every 100 cameras per server, and then you need storage server and then annual upgrade and support licenses. When it comes to Pelco Video Expert, you, you, everything comes inclusive in terms of hardware and software. It's a uh, you know, combined system that comes to you. Uh, you don't have any licenses in terms of camera licenses or server licenses. Um, the, your um, software is already uh, built in with three years uh, support, and uh, you know all the hardware comes with five years, which comes uh, which which comes as part of the package. So your um, in in this in the competition VMS case, you basically have a major capex investment as well as then operating costs. Um, I, you know, for some of the projects that we know of, which are fairly large, like the Dubai airport here, um, the, the investment in the uh, support licenses year on year is almost, um, I don't know, 20% of the project investment itself in terms of the software. So it's, it's significantly high and that keeps increasing as the years go by, right? So with Video Expert, your, your major investment is in your CAPEX and that's really where, the, uh, where our, our differentiation in terms of costs come in. The other interesting aspects is the, is the licensing part. Uh, so what are the different permutation and combinations? And, and this is a question that we get asked a lot. So just to summarize that, you, if you have Pelco cameras, if you have Pelco VMS and you have Pelco storage devices, your camera licenses are um, uh, free and it's included as part of the VXS and you don't pay a per camera channel license cost at all. If you, uh, the other interesting part is that say you decide to choose a third party camera option with Pelco VMS and Pelco storage. Um, in that case as well, it is completely license free. So you don't have a per camera channel license or a per server license cost. That is a major differentiator for Pelco solutions because if you look at the market, you've got two types of solutions. One where they do end to end like the Honeywells and the Bosch and all of these type of systems. And then the other um, uh, is the, the, the software only uh, uh, solutions, which do the, uh, like Milestone and, uh, and uh, Genetech and all of them who do third party storage and, and then you know, work on licenses. We sit in the middle and give the, you know, uh, give the end user or the partner the flexibility to do both. Uh, to do both, um, to do and, and allows you to uh, choose um, to go with third-party cameras without storage options. Um, 
in the, the the last part gives you another combination, which is uh, with, whether you if you choose to go with either Pelco cameras or third party uh, on with compliant cameras with the Pelco VMS software and third party storage. Uh, in that case, we we uh, we then package it like a typical uh, you know software only option with licenses and server. So what is options for you to choose with your end user? What configuration to go with. It is extremely easy to shift between a uh, Pelco end-to-end -end, uh, option uh, with no licenses to attaching third-party storage and then activating the licenses only for that third-party storage option. Or you can have existing st storage uh, that you want to use and then add new, third, uh, new Pelco storage uh, and still have no licenses for the cameras that are recording on the Pelco storage. So it's extremely flexible. Um, it's completely open in terms of how you want to integrate and how you want to bring in these third party components. In. Any, uh, Sharaf, is there anything you want me to uh, talk a little more about in terms of the questions that are coming on chat? If they are answering to that, uh, I can continue on it. Okay, all right, great. Um, let's look at the workstation options now. Um, so there are there are different ways that um, you know you you can talk about the storage and everything that we do in the back end. But what happens in the front end in terms of the day-to-day uh, -day operations? And this is the this is where the op the uh, monitors and how we connect to the monitors come into play. You've got different types of, um, of workstations. We've got rack-mounted workstation uh, uh, connected to monitor connected to monitor on the network. Uh, you've got a desktop workstation that's connected. You've got Got something that we call the shared display decoder, which can be a remote uh, uh, desk, like a desktop or a kiosk kind of uh, um, an interface. And then you've got the traditional uh, control room system where you have multiple workstations that are connected to multiple monitors. I'm going to go a little bit more deep into the uh, into the different type of workstations that we have. We've got basically uh, two options in terms of what you can give as a as a interface experience. Uh, one is the enterprise decoder. Uh, so the enterprise decoder allows you to work as um, as a, in sort of in a video wall functionality method. Uh, you've got multiple monitors. You can run your mouse across uh, in any of these monitors that are connected uh, to this six monitor workstation. The limitation being that you can only connect six monitors, and that be, that is limited to the the capability of the hardware. Um, so you can connect uh, each of these boxes will each of the monitors will have a decoder. One of the reasons why we've done this exercise of having decoders at the back of uh, the monitor is to allow you to do multiple high definition streaming. Um, uh, sometimes what happens in, in, you know, a lot of the competitive cases is that um, uh, the, uh, the, they will not be able to stream um, multiple high definition views because they're doing, you know, because they have you're, ba you're basing it on a graphics card and connecting it, uh, connecting one workstation to two monitors, etc. Um, it just means that you have to make sure that your hardware is higher end and you know higher spec. In our case, because we're attaching these decoders, uh, you can do any number of uh, high definition videos on that you can stream on these monitors, and uh, you can do sort of a video wall functionality in terms of stretching one or two cameras. And I say this very uh, cautiously because uh, obviously it is still workstation dependent. So if you have, if you want to do multiple, you know, in a large control room, you want to do multiple cameras that you're stretching across multiple monitors, etc. I would still recommend that you look at a video wall controller. However, for the for the standard video wall features, which allows you to, um, you know, take one or two cameras, stretch it across, move your mouse across multiple monitors, uh, you know, have that kind of video wall experience, you're good to go with the enterprise decoder. In terms of the shared display decoder, now this works on the Microsoft shared display concept. So uh, we still do have customers or end users that want to be able to uh, throw cameras on specific monitors, call them, you know, during operations, and they don't they don't really care whether they can move the mouse across multiple monitors or have a video wall experience. They are more operation driven. Uh, for those customers, the shared display decoder works better. Um, so basically, you uh, connect the shared display uh, decoders uh, behind every monitor. All on, uh, they're all network appliances, and then you have a single workstation with a single keyboard and, and, and joystick. So you could have more than six monitors or twelve, or you know, depending on the control room configuration, you can access any of these monitors using shared display decoders. Um, so if I had monitor number eleven where I wanted to pop four PTZ 
cameras using one workstation keyboard joystick one operator can can throw in that uh, by calling that monitor so this allows uh, more flexibility in terms of the operational aspect of things uh, let's look at a fully fully functional uh, uh, video wall setup uh, you know you have multiple 60 inch monitors uh, uh, in this case, each of them has a, a shared display decoder. And then you have uh, operation wo operator workstations, multiple operator workstations with monitors for spot monitoring or maps or you know, whatever they'd like uh, to, to configure. And this, this allows any of these operators, this kind of a configuration allows any of these operators to access any of the wall monitors that are there, um, any of these 14, 16 inch monitors. And that's the flexibility of having a shared display type of setup. It is purely dependent on uh, you know, the operational requirements of the control room. It's a good question to ask when you're taking requirements uh, from customers. Uh, do they normally use video wall functionality? You know, or do they have multiple operators, each one having their own space uh, or area of coverage? Uh, in which case the, um, the enterprise decoder would work and you know, it, would be, uh, the, it would be functional for them or more useful for them. If they are looking at multiple monitors and they want to be able to act all the operators or every operator should be able to access all the monitors, then a shared display decoder methodology is, is more effective. Right. Um, this is the part that I struggle with because it's features. I'm going to, I have tried to, we've tried to put up some videos, uh, you know, to describe the features. Um, but yeah, again, please request for a demo and, you know, definitely get a real feel of the system. Uh, get a hands-on uh, experience. Uh, it is extremely, extremely uh, user-friendly and customer-oriented, um, and, and you'll see the value of that as we go forward. So uh, let's go a little more deeper into user interface. Uh, um, the user interface, uh, we, we actually hired Google uh, engineers to, to build the user interface. Uh, what that meant for, uh, for, for us is that uh, we were able to do sort of a hashtag experience or tagging as we call it on video experts. So for an operator, when he, uh, uh, when he configures a camera, he can attach tags to it, which means he can say uh, lobby camera, uh, facing reception, looking at fire exit. And he can actually tag it in this way so that when he is searching for it, he can search via the tags and he doesn't have to remember the camera number uh, and when it's thousands of, cam thousands of cameras, this can be extremely useful. Uh, we also have a YouTube-like interface, which means only when you put the mouse, uh, uh, the mouse uh, on top of the cell will the controls come up. Otherwise, it's a clean interface. You know, the operator doesn't have to be looking at multiple, multiple bits on, on the cells. Uh, it's very clean and, and a neat kind of an interface. Um, you can find cameras fairly easy, like this video will show you. You can sort it by source name, by you know its details. Uh, it's very easy to find online cameras, offline cameras, etc. So the interface is something that uh, you know has uh, has been highly. Uh, uh, we've we've got a lot of uh, credit and, and recognition for the way our interface works. Um, I'm going to go into a little more of the workspaces. Uh, so another interesting thing that we have as a feature is workspaces. So when, when you have multiple operators coming in day shift, night shift, et cetera, normal VMSs are uh, the, 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 uh, the configuration of how the control uh, video wall uh, setup is, is based on the login of the person. So which means that if I'm an operator that's coming in morning shift or night shift, I get to see one view. Uh, but operationally, when you look at it, the night shift view is different from the day shift, right? So you, uh, me as, an, uh, uh, as a user can actually configure my workspace. Uh, so I can make a, a day space work shift, uh, a, a day space workspace, sorry, a day shift workspace. Um, so which means multiple monitors together can be, will change into showing me cameras that are important for me in the daytime. Uh, and then I can do a night shift uh, uh, workspace. I can do a VIP workspace, which means if there is a space environment where a VIP is moving and you know, then we have certain very important cameras that have to pop up, I can customize that workspace. Say somebody, um, there are some control rooms that are highly secure. And so if there is a visitor there, they don't want them to see the workspace that they're showing. So then you can you know, customize it to another type of workspace. Very extremely uh, open to for for you to customize and sequence and you know set up uh, uh, events uh, based on the uh, the workspace use. Sorry. 
this is camera sequencing. Uh, so you can sequence the cameras in two by two, three by three, or five by five mode, which means multiple cameras will um, run. This is, um, you, you have uh, basically situational awareness or mapping, uh, so where you can do GPS mapping, vehicle positioning, etc. So there are a lot of options in terms of mapping. Uh, this video will kind of give you a little more detail about how, how Video Expert does mapping. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's part of the native uh, interface. You can pick up one map uh, and then you configure the cameras on it. Um, you can have multiple types of um, events uh, popping up depending on what. Um... So the next important aspect is event management. So uh, this is how the events pop up depending on the trigger that you've set. So you could have, you could customize the events. It can be an alarm sound. It can be uh, certain specific names that you want in terms of, you know, is it high, sec high, uh, high security event? Is it a low security event? Um, when it's been acknowledged, then you know you can have reports that you take out or a, a log that is maintained for uh, for the events that are set out. Um, this is an this is an interesting uh, interface for investigation. So um, our investigation um, features are quite quite intense. As you can see, you can have multiple view, and then uh, you'll have uh, basically a uh, a track uh, file. Uh, you can do clips out of that log file uh, and then pull it up in, in terms of a playlist. Uh, once you, you build a playlist of whichever minutes that you want from the investigation file, you can uh, rearrange this and export it out completely as a playlist. Now, this has been an, uh, a differentiator for us because most of the other VMSs, when you export uh, uh, files for um, uh, in the in, uh, when you export cl clips from the, from the investigation mode, uh, most of the time people uh, don't know which one to play first and what's the sequence and how did the event happen, etc. In our case, we, because you're exporting it out and you have a playlist for it, uh, exactly in the way that the person who exported it wants you to view it, you just click on play and it'll play that in sequence. So you'll actually get the whole story in one go, and that makes a big difference in when you have multiple clips and you're you're on short on time in terms of investigation. Um, you can synchronize the time, which you'll see. Uh, so you can put one camera in 11.28 and then synchronize all of them to be playing at the same time. Um, so this is just a quick overview of how that works. Uh, so they've pulled out a 360-degree uh, camera uh, where now they're, they're picking up a time. Uh, So the yeah the the thumbnail will show you exactly the the, the timeline that they have uh, you know that they have uh, demonstrated. Uh, and then what you can do is once you pop this in, um, it will it it's and and you press the button of synchronize sync here. Uh, everything will go into that same timeline. Uh, so now you have a common uh, bar 
that will allow you to sing, to uh, move it move it um, and view uh, different cameras at the same timeline which becomes important then in terms of investigation and then you can highlight it out and then pull out specific clips so you get you make a whole trimmed playlist um, in terms of investigating it Right, some of the other interesting features are rules engine, which I'm sure is useful for a lot of end users. So uh, what uh, this is where you can customize how the system, uh, how to respond when there is an, a trigger event. Uh, do you want to send an email when, uh, when there is supposing a device gets offline or if there's motion or if supposing some license is expiring or the hard disk has failed, you can trigger an email. Um, this becomes useful in terms of maintenance uh, for many of the integrators if your KPIs are uh, based on uh, uh, you know how quickly you respond, etc. You can use this to show how quickly uh, you have responded once the email has come, uh, etc. So rules engine you can customize it uh, to define responses for any type of triggers uh, in in the VX. Um, we've got multiple uh, streaming support, uh, which means that you you're not only limited to the li the live view and the recording view. You can even use the third stream for um you know doing a different resolution like you know doing you could do four sif with 25 fps if you want to use it in an ipad or a um, smaller device etc so you can stream you have your video expert gives you the option of having multiple streams uh and, con and uh, configuration of that uh you yeah you've got camera reports so even when your uh, report is uh, even if you're not on the vx system you can run a vx toolbox report and it, it works standalone um, if you have a camera that has that is using a recording on the SD card uh, uh, because the network has failed or uh, you know because the camera is no longer online connected to the system, uh, uh, many VMSs what they what they f find challenging is they will pull it back uh, into the storage, but they won't know where to place it or how to refill it back uh, without the gap. In Video Expert, what it does is it pulls it and fits it back into the exact place. So for the operator, he doesn't realize that you know this was actually recorded on the SD card or um, and you know there's no difference in terms of reviewing uh, the stored stored video. Um, if we also have a fe uh, feature called the view only solution. So say you have multiple sites or you have um, an operator that is sitting somewhere remotely who only wants to do live view or he only wants to uh, see uh, the, the live cameras. You don't need to invest in a, in a separate uh, storage uh, solution um, you know where you're you're done your mirror recording. You can use uh, the view only option that allows you to just view the um, the, uh, uh, the 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 cameras without having the the on the existing VMS itself. Um, and this makes it a lot more cost effective. Uh, and now we come to integrations. Now this is a whole different uh, discussion altogether. I've summarized it in terms of some of the uh, high level integrations, but there's there's no limit to what we can do in terms of integrations. And the reason is uh, we have a, a independent integration team that looks at various uh, systems, uh, various ways to integrate to systems. We've had a lot of requirements uh, in terms of integrating with customer solutions, in terms of visitor management, in terms of, uh, in, in Dubai recently, we've got a government regulation where all the cameras have to be connected back into their common com command control room. Uh, where they are monitoring if the camera goes online or offline. So they have a, a interface. It's completely third party. It's only done in the in for the Dubai region, uh, and yet we've uh, you know we've customized and integrated with them directly. So integration does not mean it's only global or it's only you know for certain regions. It's um, specific to your region. If there is a, a specific requirement that you have with the system, uh, reach out to the team. Uh, they'll find a way to you know, meet that integration. If there is an SDAK kit available or if there is an interface available for us to connect to a third party application, uh, that is something that is possible for us to do. Um, so a summary of what we, you know, just a broad level summary, we do access control systems, analytics, the alarm management systems, perimeter protection, ANPR, uh, retail applications, uh, you know, gaming applications, uh, uh, a lot of integrations. I'll just quickly run through a few few uh, important ones. Access control, obviously we, we, we integrate very closely with access control. You can uh, bring data from the access control system into the VMS. Sorry, one thing I forgot to highlight in the integrations is that the most important thing with Video Expert is it allows the VMS to become this main management platform. 
uh, when you bring integrations into play, the, the, the traditional way to do it was to have the access control system or the, as the main security management system. So everything would go, we would send video to the access control, we would send uh, you know, uh, other alarms to the access control system. The challenge is that the operator spends majority of his time on the VMS, right? So he had to always play around between the SMS and the VMS. Um, that's why we kind of have driven this ideology that um, the VMS can be the common interface. You can bring all third party alarms in it and it doesn't matter if it's access control or if it's ANPR or if you have to, and I'll show you some of the slides on how we open gate barriers even you know, via the VMS interface. And that makes the VMS extremely um, powerful and, and uh, you know, extremely useful for the uh, operator. Um, this is just a, an, a, a screenshot of an access control integration for a particular system, but it can be anything. You can bring events here. You can do triggers based on uh, events from the access control system. Um, this is a, the, the casino application that I was telling you about. Uh, in this, um, in this uh, integration, the, they're using RFID chips on the card. And if you can see uh, in that e-connect interface on your right, um, you, all the information about that car, car, about the cards and how they're playing and even the trends of how they're winning and losing is visible on the video expert interface because the, the information is available on the gaming application, in this case eConnect, uh, but we are able to bring that along with the video together so that the, op the operator or the people who are monitoring this gets an actual real-time view of the situation. Um, the above uh, picture also shows you how it works in terms of a retail application. So you can you can identify track and respond to ac act activities. You can access live and re be recorded video. So it's quite seamless in terms of transactional data. Uh, this is intrusion. So this is for us from a, for a city surveillance kind of uh, requirement. You can do real time monitoring. You can you know make a line on the pedestrian, for example, and uh, every time somebody crosses that pedestrian, when uh, when there is a trigger, you can have a um, uh, alarm raised, um, you know, all these kind of applications that uh, that that you that that are interfaced with. Um, license plate recognition uh, in our region, it is a mandatory government requirement. I'm sure you know there's a lot of places in in yours as well that that requires you to have uh, license plate tracking monitoring. Um, license plate can be very interesting when you use it along with gate barrier control or VIP uh, uh, VIP. Um, uh, management. You know, some some hotels, for example, they like to give their repeat customer the feeling that they're coming to a familiar place. So if their number plate is registered with them, automatically when they come drive in, uh, the gate barrier will open and they'll allow them to go, they'll allow them to go inside. Um, you can. Uh, I'm just going to share some screenshots of some of the stuff that we've done uh, for specific uh, local uh, re uh, uh, license plate uh, recognition and in integration. Um, so. As you can see, every all the information that you need about license plate recognition or automated number plate recognition is available on the video expert interface. So the whole, um, you know, which car, what num what time, what color, etc., is visible. Um, investigating it based on um, uh, looking whether it is a registered number plate, whether it's blacklisted, who's the owner, how many times has he come in, uh, what are the you know prop uh, vehicle properties. Um, should we open the gate barrier or not? And this is the gate barrier control that I was telling you about. You can you can choose that. You can pull out reports, uh, city wise. If if you've got a region specific report, you can do gate wise, in and out report, hourly report. How many times did this visitor come in? You know, all kinds of reports that you can you can pull out in, in number plate. And just to make it make uh, you know, just to let you know, this is all customized and built for this application. The same thing applies for access control, for lighting control, for any other type of integration as well. This is just an example I pulled out for ANPR, but you can do all of this for other applications as well. Uh, this is a registered, so you can see a blacklisted vehicle number plate that pops up when somebody who's not supposed to be there uh, turns up. Um, yeah, so, so that's the ANPR part. I'm just, you know, face recognition and many of the other detail analytics is a totally different uh, presentation altogether. Um, but just to give you an overview, uh, we do have, um, you know, a, a very close partner that we work with for face recognition, very highly accurate. Um, the other interesting thing in terms of face recognition is, uh, and this is server-based analytics, is that you can add faces on the go. So if you're in a mall, uh, there are two ways that people do face recognition. One is you have a database, which is the way the police does it. They have a record of everybody's photographs, and then they start searching for the face. 
uh, based on based on the picture. In this case, you can actually take it one step behind. If you're a mall operator or if you're a, uh, you know, like a theme park operator, et cetera, and you want to add faces, you can add faces as they are captured, create your own database. And the beauty of the system is that as they are recognized, say this visitor comes in in 2015 and he comes back in 2016 and he's built, well, he's grown a beard. Um, the system will update his latest profile to his uh, latest image to his profile. So every profile will have multiple images of people, uh, people's uh, face, facial, facial uh, changes, or just updating to the latest photograph that's available based on the recognition. So very, very um, you know, easy to use. Uh, quite, quite good on score on, in terms of face recognition. Uh, we've had a lot of, uh, we've done a lot of proof of concepts where, you know, people, customers have been surprised at the level of accuracy and at how easy it is to use uh, the face recognition interface. Um, yeah, this is just a quick video that shows you how it's capturing the faces and um, frame by frame. So once it's captured, you can go up to that particular file, uh, change the name, uh, you know, add them to the database, search them uh, based on on that particular name, etc. And all the all the places that this person has been in will now be popping up and and available for uh, view. It will tell you which area, what cam camera number it was at, um, and you know, show you how you can uh, show you the video clip that is associated with that person at that time. Uh, I mean, this is obviously a detailed, I think I am kind of low on time. Uh, this is a detailed view um, of how the NPR then can be filtered out and pulled out. Right. So to summarize, why choose video expert end to end? Um, one, you've got no licensing, uh, like I said, no camera channel license, no server license, no storage license fees. It's open and flexible to any type of camera and any brand. Uh, no channel license fee when you add uh, to storage. It, it connects to any third party storage and video expert software option. Um, you can you lower the IT footprint, like I mentioned, because you don't have recording servers and all of this uh, infrastructure. Uh, you've got full high definition monitor viewing and control, complete redundancy and fault tolerance, no single point of failure. Um, you've got guaranteed lo long-term support and migration plans. For some of you who are familiar with our older uh, hardware like Digital Sentry and Endura, you've got a, a, a migration plan. This is something that Falco really uh, believes in. You know, we don't like leaving customers in the lurch, uh, come out with a software application after two, hour, two years and say, oh, we've actually moved platforms, so now you, know, you can't use the old one. Um, we fully believe in uh, migration plans. Um, you will see that a lot of our uh, systems are compatible or hardware is compatible even when it is six, seven, eight, nine years older. Um, we're open to any third party integrations uh, like access control, ENPR and analytics, and it's infinitely scalable. There's no number of cameras that are limited to you know, this particular software or anything of that sort. So it's, you can scale the system, add larger volumes of cameras as, as your infrastructure grows. Uh, how we can help you as a as a final summary, uh, like we we definitely have a full line of products as you've seen. We've got a, a, a very strong technical support uh, program. Um, I'm sure Saran uh, briefed you in the beginning. Uh, our technical support uh, is something that we emphasize and are highly, uh, you know, people really talk about telco tech support because we we not only uh, are available on remote, we can come to site, you know, we can support you when there are commissioning issues. Uh, we do something that's called the professional services, which is where in, um, you as an integrator can call a Pelco person or uh, invest in a Pelco person coming to, for a large project and they will support you uh, in, in guiding you on how to do the best configuration, what are the tips and tricks. The website, uh, I encourage all of you to go and you know register yourself, or be a, uh, uh, have a look at the website. There's a wealth of information about camera and technology on the website. 
uh, you can you have um, uh, software demos that you can download and and, and view. Um, there's also Pelco Learning Center. Uh, uh, again, something that we call uh, PLC. Uh, there are a lot of courses online available. Um, you know, just like we're doing this webinar right now, there are also online webinars in terms of IP techniques, in terms of networking, etc., that you can access. So definitely go and register yourself at uh, P uh, PLC. That's about it. That's uh, that's pretty much uh, uh, about the video expert in a high level. Uh, I hope I'm within time, Sharon. Yes, Vidya, you are well within time, and thank you so much for the informative session. I hope uh, all of the participants would have, uh, you know, found it insightful. And please uh, feel free to share if you want to work on any projects proactively, reactively. Please contact Supertron. We are fully aligned with them, you know. Uh, if there's any question, both. sorry, if there's any question that you'd like to ask, uh, you know, online that you think is very important, uh, you can as well now. We can take the questions online if you, we've got a couple of minutes and then. Yes, that, that's a valid point because we have some time with us, so we can utilize that time uh, in, uh, you know, getting back to you on your questions. You can feel free to ask them on the chat window. Even if you uh, have some questions later on as well, please feel free to contact Supertron and we will get back to you with the answers. And as I said, uh, you know, uh, if you have some projects where you want us you know, to work proactively or reactively with Pilco, please feel free to contact Supertron and we will take it forward from there. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so is there any person with whom we can be in touch with for the B2B projects? Yes, absolutely. As I said, uh, we have a complete team here. We have Supertron as a distributor available. So they have the team. We have our teams in place. So we will take it to you. Anything you want to do, you will come back to us and we'll, we'll take it forward from there. We have, we have the complete infrastructure available. We have the teams. We have the labs. Uh, we have you know, whatever is required to uh, work on a project opportunity locally. We have everything available. How the Pelco working is, 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 is this uh, B2B team and uh, channel team or both or single? Uh, okay, so just to brief you about it, so we are majorly working through distribution. As I said, Supertron is one of our distributors. So all our all our supplies happen through distribution and installation testing commissioning. We ideally we expect the system integrator to do it, but if in certain cases they want some support on commissioning and all, so we have pro services available where our engineers can help you with commissioning. They will not do the complete commissioning, but they can support you and help you with the commissioning uh, with the pro services. Yes, okay. we work through we work through uh, our supplies happen through distribution and uh, all the installation testing commissioning we expect system integrated to do it. And if you want technical trainings on that, we are open. We can organize those technical trainings as well uh, for your team. So, in case of any query or any uh, requirements, I should be in touch with the Supertron team, right? Yes, yes. There'll be a first point of contact. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have a question here. I'm Rakesh from Nagpur. Uh, 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 just wanted to understand what kind of video analytics support also is available with you? Uh, where in you analyze industries? Yeah, industry, we want a specific, uh, uh, what do you say, conveyor has to be watched and there has to be some video analytics in there. So that, that those kind of things can be is possible with you? We can, we can definitely look into it. We don't have something ready-made for that, but uh, we can definitely look into that request. Please feel, uh, you know, please share that information with us and let's see if we have some ecosystem partners with us who can do that. Because we work with a lot of third-party systems as well, as I said, which are integrated with our systems. So if one of our ecosystem partners have that solution, we can get, you know, get, get that solution to you. Just share with us more details on that and uh, we'll look into So whom do I uh, talk to? I am, I am Rajesh Sena uh, from Jamsetpur. Hello. Hello, I am Rajesh from Jamsetpur. Rajesh, I was just completing the last... Uh, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yo, please yeah, carry on. Yeah, yeah. So I was just mentioning that, you know, so please uh, contact this. You. So, uh, Adeb, can you, uh, if, you know, uh, share with your the team members detail? Because I think uh, the, <laughs> if you can mention that somewhere, all your, all your contact details with the regional uh, people numbers, email IDs and phone numbers and share with all the partners. So that if they have any query such requests, they can immediately get back to us and we can start working on those. Yeah, because we have certain two projects which are there lined up. So we would like to work with you. Sure, sure. Thank you. And uh, Devra, just keep, uh, take a note of it. We should act on this. Yeah.
Yeah, I have noted on the chat and my number and uh, details. Okay. Rajesh, please, sir. Yeah, actually, while discussing about the uh, two, three types of servers, like 64 channel, 100 channel, and 100 plus channels, uh, we have discussed upon the MBPS about the bandwidth of the that that they can uh, carry and take over. I want to know if we are having a 64 channel, what is the minimum MBPS required for it, uh, say, 4 MP camera, and can it accommodate 64 channel? Okay, Aman, you would like to go for that question? Yeah, so uh, as you were asking, I mean, uh, we, we have a, a dedicated Pelco storage estimator as uh, covered in the presentation. So mm -hmm. we, uh, it, it depends uh, side to side. So we as a multiple camera supporting S.265 video compression, and uh, we we have a multiple level of uh, S.265 plus Pelco smart compression. So mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and plus as you asked for the storage parameter, resolution, frame per second, the uh, variable bit rate, and 24 hours, no motion. So these, these are parameters are going to uh, depend on the overall. But we give you a brief idea. So let's say we, we have a 5 megapixel camera in a pro series. So if you set a 5 megapixel with the 25 FPS, with the full smart compression, uh, full level, high level, so it will be around 2.3 Mbps of uh, throughput. So you can multiply with the uh, multiple number of cameras. <laughs> Uh, my second question is that, for sorry, example, uh, just, just, so, sorry, one more thing I just wanted to clarify. Um, there is no 64 channel kind of a concept in terms of storage for Pelco. Um, mm -hmm. Any of the boxes that you're talking has a storage uh, capacity, right? So you either have a 96 TB or a 144 TB. Uh, and these boxes have a throughput uh, like 700 Mbps or 1000 to 1000 Mbps. So it's, it's bandwidth dependent. So you can um, in, in, in a, let's take a configuration like he said, right? 2.2 Mbps, 2.2 um, Mbps into multiple number of cameras uh, for particular storage requirement that you have. You could mm -hmm. have 100 cameras or 200 cameras depending on what, you know, what you're recording, uh, for how long you're recording. So it's not dependent on the number of channels per se. So that is a, a, a milestone or a, you know, th th that type of system. That concept. flexibility we have as a well. So yeah. 700 yeah. oblique 2500 Mbps is the scalability or what? It's the bandwidth that can be managed by the hardware box. Okay. In terms of streaming. Okay. In terms of streaming. So that's why I'm okay. saying do, do, not think, do not think of it in terms of, uh, uh, you know, oh, we can do, for, like, I know recording servers in, in uh, you know, a, a third party architecture works like that. So you can do 64 cameras in one recording server. It, for us, we don't have that limitation at all. It's, uh, in fact, uh, in, in our, I, I'm not very specific about this requirement, but in our requirement uh, in locally here, two megapixel cameras with uh, 31 days of recording in a 96 TB box, we can accommodate 200 to 50 cameras in that box right. for that type. So it, it's One more challenge, uh, Divya, that I face normally, uh, for example, if you're having 60 Mbps camera with you, okay? Mm -hmm. Now it is through put of the, your Mbps might be very high when uh, live streaming. Okay. But when you want to record the things, for example, if you want to record a number plate, so number plate you can record in high uh, FPS, but when you are seeing the recording, so you cannot record under 60 FPS. So normally people record under say 10 FPS or 15 FPS. Okay. In that case, if the number plates are visible uh, in the recording also. Uh, uh, you want me to take the question with you? Yeah, you can, yeah. Sure. So uh, reading the number plate is not uh, depending on the number of frame. Of course, uh, right. if you wanted to get a probability of reading, a higher reading of the number plate, you need to go with higher frame rate. But this mm -hmm. is, there are other factors which decides how you read the number plate. There is something called shutter speed. Uh, when th this was, this is what it decides the number plate details. Like example, if you setting it your I frame interval uh, to a lower I frame, and I frame interval is a full frame, okay, to five frames, ten frames per second. Even if you recorded at fifty, you'll be able to get the details. If you're setting your I frame and P frame interval for a longer period, for let's, let's say, for example, you're putting I frame and then after 60 frames, you're putting the next I frame, in between you're, you're configuring it to have it as a P frame, then even if you're recording at 60 frames per second, you, if you pause it at any instant, you'll not be able to read the details. That's purely, it's a combination of how you set your cameras, actually. We, can, we are even able to achieve uh, the detail number plate at five frames per second. 
So it's purely yeah. depending on how you set your camera, the camera configurations, not about that's how many that's frame good. you have. That's, that's great, Aman. That's great. Actually, I, we will not lose any information as such in a live streaming as versus recording. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you, Aman, and thank you, Dibya. Do we have more questions? Waiting for one more minute. Okay, so we have really no more for the questions. So thank you so much. And as I said, uh, for any queries, uh, questions, please uh, you know get back to Supertron and your project requirements for active reactive project requirements. Please, we can uh, please get in touch with Supertron and we'll take it forward from there. Thank you, Debra. Do you want to just uh, for closing? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Aman. I hope you can hear me, Aman. Yes, yes, they can hear you. Yeah. Thanks, Aman. Thanks for your wonderful session. Thanks, Vidya. Uh, I think uh, most of our partner is now uh, able to go back to their customer after lockdown period is over and uh, they can discuss uh, about the requirements and then they can able to position in right manner to their customer. So dear partner, thank you very much for your patience <coughs> learning. Uh, I request you all to uh, <coughs> give us the opportunity. I think one of uh, uh, you have uh, requested for the yes, uh, that we can provide you the three level support system. First level is on the sales. Second level is on the pre sales and the third level uh, in the post sales. So all the three levels, the support system we can able to provide to you in coordination with the Palco team in the back ends. So we love to work with you all and uh, wish you all the best. Uh, stay at home and uh, safe and healthy. Uh, that's uh, our prayer to everybody. Take care of your family. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.